One day, I decided to go to an old cemetery in San Diego, California, in a town called Julian. This town was home to gold miners and citizens that built the town. The average year on the tombstone was 17 to 1800s, some ranging into 2000 to 2008. We went out there around the time of 12 p.m., just going around asking basic questions of anything that might be there. I stumbled on a gated burial dating 1825. I asked if he was there while someone was taking a video and pictures. All of a sudden, I got so tired and drained that I felt like we had to go. I felt like I was being attacked. When we got to the car, we reviewed the photos first. What I saw was disturbing. White, blue, and green lights flying all around me. Listening to the audio was even scarier. I heard an old man with a deep, crackly voice laughing and saying, Marissa, and then I heard growling noises. I asked to leave immediately after hearing this. We were driving away and about a half mile to a mile out, our car started doing really frightening stuff. The radio would turn on and off, headlights would stop working, our mirrors kept moving dramatically, the lights in the car were turning on and off. We pulled over, we were so scared. Eventually it stopped and we drove off scared and confused as to what had just happened. When we arrived home, we could hear voices and banging in the house. We didn't sleep at all that night. I never did return, and until this day, eight years later, I can still hear that voice, and I hate driving by that cemetery. A few years back, I was babysitting a little girl who was around four. I'll call her Emma. So Emma was a bubbly child, very energetic and always laughing. She also happened to have an imaginary friend named George with whom she played constantly, but she never really mentioned him other than to tell me and her parents who she was playing with. One day, as she was playing with this George, she suddenly turned to me and said, George doesn't like you. I was startled and asked her why he didn't like me, but Emma only repeated what she'd said before. I asked what George looked like, and she said that he was very tall with a red face and an eye patch. I, of course, got creeped out. Fortunately, she never said anything like that again but I would sometimes catch her whispering to herself as she stared at me, only to resume playing when she saw that I caught her. Let me start by saying that growing up my little sister never slept in our room as a child, like ever. Normally she would sleep with my mom due to her freaking out about one thing or another. To be honest, it made me feel a little bit uncomfortable about sleeping in there by myself, which I did every night. Her constant freakouts about it, coupled with the feeling of being watched while I was in there alone, even in the middle of the day, made me feel super uneasy. That being said, there was one night that I came home from hanging out with my boyfriend at the time, and I walked into my room. And who do I see? My little sister. At the time, she was five and I was 15, and she was totally fine and in the top bunk. I was incredibly surprised that my mom got her to sleep in her own bed. She looks down from her bunk and points to my great-grandmother's rocking chair. It was then that I noticed that it was slightly rocking back and forth. She laughed as she pointed and said, look, it's grandma. I immediately yelled for my mom to take her and the rocking chair out of my room. My great grandma had died a few months before and my sister barely knew her. Without pictures, she wouldn't even know what she looked like. 
It was so creepy. Every once in a while, I'm asked, what's the creepiest thing a kid has ever said to you? And this is always my response. My son used to say things like, in former times when I was older, usually followed by something older people would say. He would say things like, in former times when I was older, we would have to wait for the milkman to bring the milk. When he started school, we had to tell him that maybe this wasn't the best thing to say to the other kids. He said it so regularly and casually that we were a little bit worried about how the other kids would react. He stopped saying it altogether when he turned 10. I have no idea if he has any memories of these events. When my daughter was about four, we had just finished her bath. I had her on her bed, drying her off. All of a sudden, she said, Daddy just said, hey. I was taken off guard because my husband worked second shift and was not home at the time. I said, no, baby, Daddy isn't here. She said, no, Daddy just said, hey. Then she looked all weird and got scared. She didn't want to be in her room anymore. I don't know if it was my reaction or response that made her that way or not, but it sure gives me chills and creeps me out. I called my husband just to calm my nerves and make sure he was okay. Either way, that was still one of the creepiest things a kid has ever said to me. When my daughter was three or four, she came upstairs from playing in the basement when we were visiting family. She asked if it was okay to play with great grandpa, who was asking if he could play dolls with her. She had never heard the term great grandpa before, mainly because her great grandparents were long dead. Turns out my wife's grandpa died in that house. When my little niece was like four, we were in the car and randomly she goes, mommy, are we puppets? My sister was like, no, no, baby, we're not puppets. My niece thought about it for a moment and then said, I think we are, we just don't know it yet. Incredibly ominous little child, thanks. This has been several years back. I had to have been maybe 16 or 17 at the time. It was a Thursday and I was in the pastor's office working on a lesson for one of the classes. The church was a decent size. When you first walk into the foyer, you have stairs up to your right that go down into the basement and stairs in front that bring you to the sanctuary. From the sanctuary, you have a door on the right that leads to a ramp, which brings you to a hallway that hallway has a ramp that goes into the basement and library. On past the ramp is the nursery, a classroom, and the office on the right. Then on the left is another hallway that leads to the bathrooms, classrooms, and the gym. I'm in the office and I hear a thud coming from the sanctuary. Confused, I look out the window and see no other cars than mine. I figured maybe the pastor walked over to grab something or check on something. I called him and asked him if he was in the church. 
He explained that he and his wife were in one of the Carolinas. I asked about the deacons, and most were home or out of state. Plus, most will ring the doorbell to warn me that they're there. With the phone call confirming that I should be alone, I go out to check the noise. I get to the ramp that goes to the sanctuary, and I hear footsteps running down the ramp toward me. I couldn't see what it was. I could only hear it. I bailed and I shut myself in the office until I felt safe again. Last night, I woke up at around 2 a.m. I heard this soft yelling and was confused at first as to why somebody was out. Then, as I listened more, I realized there was a pattern to it. I wanted to get up to the window and see who was making that sound, thinking that they may just be a drunk person walking around the parking lot. But there was this overwhelming sense of dread that came over me, like, if I looked outside, I would be drawn to go outside, and if I went outside, I would never come back. This rhythmic whooping continued on for easily 20 minutes, and then stopped altogether. It was not an animal, I know this for sure. I've had paranormal experiences before, so maybe I'm easily spooked but I think I was being lured outside. And even though it sounded human, I didn't get up to look. Now it's the morning after and I can't shake this feeling. Does this sound familiar to anyone else? Some kind of hunting practice for a known humanoid or cryptid? As a note, I live in an area of owls and wild birds and I hear them consistently throughout the week. I know what they sound like. I don't have coyotes or any big cats in my area. I listen to owls outside my window often, and I can tell you that this was something different. I don't know how to explain it, but it almost sounded like a human trying to imitate an owl. I only immediately dismissed it as being a wild animal because it was so unlike anything I've ever heard. I would love to know what it could be. This incident occurred during the summer of 1983, as I was about to begin my senior year in high school. My family lived in rural Pennsylvania, in northern Indiana County. Our farmhouse was built in the mid-1800s. In the early 1900s, an addition was added to the back that more than doubled the size of the original house. The original house was a four-square house, so-called for the four square rooms, two on the first floor and two on the second floor, with a staircase in the back. The house as a whole was sturdy, albeit a bit cranky. Every night in summer, I fell asleep listening to the pops, cracks, creaking, and groans as the house cooled off in the night air. The house was built on high ground next to the mouth of an ancient ravine that ran for over a mile deeper and darker and rockier as it went, down to the north branch of a little creek. The ravine was heavily wooded at the beginning. Then the trees got sparser to a few old ones tenaciously rooted into the eroded rocks and glacial till. It was dark and cool and damp down in there, even on the hottest summer day, and I spent many summer days down in those woods. I knew the plants, the trees, the birds, the deer. I heard much that I couldn't see, like the rabbits running through the brush and the squirrels high up scolding me as I walked. I could sense the ones that hid and made no noise, the bobcats lurking in the nocturnal critters and peeking at my back after I passed their burrows. Sometimes sudden waves of total silence would descend on the woods. The air would be still, the birds would silence themselves. I taught myself to stop at these moments and to observe. 
I knew it wasn't me that made the animals go silent, so I figured something, a bobcat perhaps, was close by. I never saw what it was that caused the silences, but I loved to imagine myself as a skilled tracker. Nothing of the sort, of course, but I will claim to know those woods. I also had a friend and companion that roamed the woods and ravines around with me, a big male German shepherd named Chap. Chap loved to run and roam and chase groundhogs. We prowled along through the woods for years. This particular night, I awoke suddenly, very awake and alert. The wind was blowing against the open window. Our room had the crank out windows that were popular in the 70s when the hose had been remodeled. The bottom of the window tilted out and the rain ran off. There was a low rumble off in the distance the thunder of a summer storm blowing in from the west. I was laying on my belly, my face on the left side on my pillow, and my arms around and under my pillow. I listened to the rain. It was not unusual for me to wake up in the middle of the night. It's been a regular occurrence in my life since I was very young. By that point, I was 17 years old. I was used to my 3 a.m. ritual, though still very irritated by it. Across the room, I could hear my brother breathing. I could hear our dog lying on the foot of my brother's bed, sniffing at the rainy night air blowing in the window. Across the hall from our room, I could hear my dad's low, steady, rumbling snore. Then I heard something that made my eyes fly open in the pitch black room. From down in the ravine, off in the distance, I heard an animal call unlike any I had ever heard. It was a roar, an angry roar. To the best of my knowledge, the apex predator in those woods was the bobcat, but this was too deep, too throaty for a bobcat. Then I heard it again, surprisingly closer, a lot closer. I listened for my brother's breathing, silence. He was awake. What was that? I loudly whispered. I don't know. He whispered back. There was obvious concern in his voice. Then we heard it again. It had to be no more than 75 feet from the house, down at the corner of the yard where the trail led into the woods and down into the ravine. First of all, it was no bobcat. It was not a dog. It was not a coyote, and it was most definitely not a man. Next to my bed was a softball bat. I still have it, as a matter of fact. That night, all I wanted in the world was to slide my hand out from under the pillow and reach down and grab that bat. But I couldn't move. Everyone in the house seemed paralyzed. I kept expecting to hear my dad throw his bedroom door open, but he never made a sound. Then, two things happened in rapid succession. There was a tremendous crash, like something or someone had run headlong into the house. Then there was another roaring, screaming howl, this time right next to the house. It was an angry, roaring shout, so loud that I felt like it was next to my face. I had never in all my life heard an animal make a noise that loud. It was like a V8 engine with straight pipes was running wide open throttle. At the same time, there was a throbbing, a low frequency growl that seemed to make the house vibrate. All I could do was close my eyes and try to scream, but nothing came out. I must have passed out. The next thing I know, it was morning. The sun was shining. The house was still there. I slept in, which was very unusual in my family. I went downstairs and my dad and brother had already left for the day. My mom stood at the sink, washing dishes. I looked at my mom wide-eyed, Surely she had heard what happened. She met my eyes and pointed to the back porch of our house, a small side room that housed the washing machine, dryer, and coat closet. I walked to the back porch to see that the door that led to the outside had been ripped from its hinges and lay flat on the floor of the porch. In the coat closet, with his nose pressed as far back as it could go, laying in a puddle of his own urine, was Chap. 
He lay there, whimpering for two days before he finally came out again. I was given the task to fix the door. When it was up and repaired, I went to my mom and basically asked, are we just going to pretend that nothing happened last night? My mom sighed with obvious exasperation and said something along the lines of, well, what would you like to know? You know what that was. Your dad knows. I know. We all know. Not much to talk about, other than how scary it was. And frankly, I don't need to talk about that, thank you. And for my family, that was pretty much the end of it. I brought it up once not long ago. My dad just shrugged and said, I know as much now as I did that night. Me? I drive there on occasion, when I'm in the area. I stop on the old country road and listen a while. I listen to the wind and the birds, and then I drive on. I'm telling this story for 80% entertainment value and 20% feedback. This is entirely true. I'm not a spiritual person. I'm resistant to energies and vibes, though I do believe that there are others who are more tapped into their surroundings than I am in that regard. And I'm a cynic with most paranormal things, except Bigfoot. I believe in the Squatch, but we ain't talking about him. I live in the foothills of Western North Carolina, near the base of the Blue Ridge. I lived in the mountains for a few years and hated it up there. I despise the woods with a burning passion. Yet, just my luck, I've moved back in with my folks, in their cabin, surrounded by woods. The land my family owns stretches across about 15 acres of woodland. Now. These are the woods I grew up in. Despite my typical aversion to nature, I do feel pretty safe in them. I climbed the trees and splashed in the creek and played with stick swords when I was a kid. These woods are home, except for the area behind the backyard. Our cabin is positioned at the top of a pretty steep hill that slopes down for about a half mile before it bottoms out at a creek down in the woods. The halfway point between the house and the creek is this little patch of woods right behind the fenced in area around the house. It's always in shade, no thick undergrowth, just trees, Carolina red clay, piles of leaves, the usual, but it feels really weird down there in a way that I can't explain. I feel very unwelcome out behind the house, and I'm not the only one. My parents avoid it too. Even our pets, past and present, have always steered clear of it. I'm going to list some experiences that might get my point across better. A. I was about eight or nine, and one summer, I thought I'd try camping in the backyard. I set up my family's unused tent, loaded it up with an air mattress and a pile of blankets, copper, my beloved deer stuffy, and some comic books. I guess I wanted to be excited about it, but even before the sun went down, when my mom was helping me set up my little camping trip, I felt uneasy. The shady patch of woods around the backyard was just weird, but I was a kid, so I figured, screw it, I'm 20 feet from the house, I'll be fine. I was not fine. I got set up for the night, stayed up reading comics, felt like an outdoorsman, and it had barely gotten dark when I began hearing loud rhythmic crunching in the woods behind the backyard, like something big was walking in circles around the undergrowth. We don't have bears in my neck of the woods. Besides, whatever it was, it was definitely walking on two legs. It never tried to approach the backyard, 
even as I sat there with copper, just listening to it, it just kept walking. I barely lasted an hour in that tent before running inside and getting into my own bed. B. My mom is an avid gardener and decided that she was going to put together four or five raised gardening beds in the backyard for herbs and veggies. This was when I was 11-ish, so naturally I was roped in to help. We spent the first part of the spring putting them together and getting them started. I began noticing that both of us would get really edgy and irritable back there. We're best friends and we never fight, but we would be snapping at each other, constantly raising that stupid garden. I also noticed for the first time that the woods behind the house are deathly quiet. Playing music or talking didn't make any difference. It was that kind of silence that presses in on you. And it's always like that back there. The beds actually thrived for a little while, but mom would always ask me to come with her when she tended to them. I thought it was silly at the time. When I got older though, she told me she just couldn't be down there by herself. She'd wait until I was home from school before checking on them because she too felt uneasy and unwelcome. Eventually, we just abandoned the project. The raised beds are still down there, by the way, just rotting away in the undergrowth. I haven't checked on them since middle school and I'm 23 now. C. Lastly, and in my opinion, the creepiest, was the time that I asked mom to cut my hair. We were poorer then, so rather than go to a salon, mom just gave me a twice monthly trim. It was late spring and warm, so she suggested we cut it in the backyard for easier cleanup. I was maybe 13 or 14 at this point. So we ventured down, I brought a stool, and I sat diligently while she cut my hair. Side note, my mom has always cut my hair, so she's very good at it. She doesn't make mistakes. This is important. As she worked and we talked, I noticed that the old familiar feeling of unease was back. We were not welcome back there. The tree stood still and shadowy, despite the brilliant sunny day. And I remember that it was cold, very cold. Mom finished up my haircut and I shook off the extra debris to let her admire her handiwork. She stepped around in front of me, angled my head this way and that, and said it looked good. Three things happened then in very quick succession. First, I felt this squeeze of pressure on my lungs, like I couldn't breathe. It was such a weird sensation that I just froze. All of the uneasiness of the atmosphere pressed in on me all at once. Second, my mom got this weird, vacant look on her face. I remember her smile fading and her eyes going a little glassy, like she was lost in thought. And then she reached out with the scissors, still making this empty expression and snipped a deep cut into the skin over my left eye. I freaked out, jumped down off the stool, and backed away. At that same time, the third thing happened. She seemed to gather herself again. She was almost in tears. She apologized over and over again. We didn't even bother to take anything with us as we ran back up to the house to treat the cut and stop the bleeding. I still have a little scar there and she's never forgiven herself for it. There wasn't even a hair hanging over that eye either. I had a pixie cut at the time. So, yeah, a few of the many weird experiences that make me avoid the backyard now. I haven't even been down there in seven or eight years, but now that I'm living here again, I just sometimes look into the backyard and feel that weird shudder of apprehension. So what's the deal?
Why don't we feel welcome in a 50 square foot patch of land that we own? Why is it so dark and quiet all the time? I have no idea, but my parents and I, we just work around it and pretend it isn't there. I've been dying to get this story off my chest for years to people who don't think I'm crazy, as it's rather maddening. Before I begin, I don't believe in things like Bigfoot, werewolves, ghosts, supernatural or paranormal stuff in general, but that doesn't mean that I'm able to explain what happened this night. This was a long time ago. I was a teenager. My parents were not very strict, so I had a lot of freedom. I had two friends, and they had their own friends as well. And one of my friend's parents owned this huge part of a forest. My friends, their friends, and I went deep into the woods with a bunch of supplies, and we started making our own treehouse and forts. It was a big part of my childhood, building stuff with my friends, and this place became our sanctuary for a long time, where we'd spend a lot of our time away from the adults. This event happened years after we built the place initially, and also after we rebuilt it because one time it got destroyed. But that's another interesting story for a different time. This is the backstory for all of the events that I'm about to recall. One friend and I spent the night at our sanctuary that we had built, which none of us have ever done before. We only hung out there and then went home. We all planned to spend the night together because it would be fun. Most of our friends weren't allowed to spend the night there, though, because of parents and other things, and one chickened out because he was afraid. So it ended up just being me and one other person, my close friend's cousin. We weren't really close at the time, and we fought a lot, but surprisingly we got along well that night. We spent most of the day swinging from trees, climbing them and hanging out on this tire rope swing while talking. It was a normal day. And then we laid down for rest at about 9 p.m. About 10 minutes after laying down in bed in our sleeping bags, talking to each other under our makeshift tents, we heard rustling. I sat up and saw a very tall silhouette of something that looked to be like a human but was transparent. I could see right through it. I squinted and froze, and it very quickly climbed this tall tree and as I was looking at it, it disappeared. I was in complete disbelief and shock. I had no idea what I had just seen, if I had seen it at all or if I had hallucinated. I wasn't scared in the moment, just perplexed. Being young and worried though, I said to my friend that we should leave and not wanting it to hear me, I got close to his ear and just said, there's something in the woods looking at us. After I said that, I saw his facial expression turn to fear, so we got up and started walking down the path out of the woods, calmly. I didn't want to sprint because it might chase, and I also wasn't even sure I'd seen anything. I just didn't want to take any chances. Very shortly after we left, we both got this weird feeling of deja vu and confusion, like we'd been hit with hard drugs or something, except we don't do drugs, and we had only eaten food that we brought from our house. There are also no hallucinogenic plants in our part of the country. Nothing like that. Everything was so slow, and I felt disoriented. But we continued to walk in this direction for quite a while, stumbling in the darkness because of our mental state. I realized that we should have been out of the forest by now. I knew that this was the way out, 110% because I'd been going in and out of this place for years, even in the dark. Yet, I didn't recognize all the trees around us, just the path. It was like our surroundings were changing. My friend randomly yells, yeah, I'm coming, as I'm looking in the opposite direction from him. I turned around, very confused, and asked him why he said that. He said that his mom was calling his name to help lead him out of the forest. I heard nothing. 
I told him that I didn't hear anything, and he looked at me like I was insane and walked off the path and into the forest. I grabbed his arm and pulled him back, because I didn't want him to get lost. That's when my friend sees the transparent thing that I saw earlier, sitting perched on a tree branch in the direction that his mom was calling him from. He points it out to me. Its transparency is almost like a heat wave effect. We stared at it for 10 seconds in total disbelief. It looked like a transparent being, but we were trying to discern if it was something else and we were just imagining it being alive because there was no movement. But then it hunched down like it was trying to stalk or be stealthy. And very quickly, it climbed up a tree a little more and then went to the next one and then the next one, getting closer to us. We can't hear it at all. It's completely silent, and its silence was exacerbated by the fact that all the other creatures had also gone completely silent, and it was only in that moment that I had really started to realize that. Not a single bug or animal had made a sound since we started leaving camp. This is when our curiosity turned into fear, and once again, we began to see it move. Once it got above us, though, the only thing we could hear was the crunching of the branch as its weight was put down on it. Every little sound that was made was so distinct because it was so quiet and remote. We couldn't see anything because the tops of the trees are so dark. We actually started running, terrified, not worrying about being calm anymore. We heard noises in the trees above us and finally it faded away ahead of us as if it had gone ahead, but the sound was a lot quieter than if a normal animal had been running through the treetops. It sounded as if this thing was very light, but it wasn't very small, so that made no sense. We still kept running forward, despite it sounding like it had gone ahead, and we ended up back at the place that we started. Many, many minutes of walking, and we were back at this place after running for like 20 seconds. It was impossible. But instead of staying on the ground, we climbed to the top of the treehouse with our items as quickly as possible and closed the door, wedging a small piece of plywood on it to keep it shut. We heard something climbing up, and extremely odd noises as well, almost like the mimicking noises of rain and wind, but there was no water seeping into our treehouse, and there would have been had it been raining, and it wasn't wet. This persisted for about a minute, and then we didn't hear from it again. I'm pretty sure at that point it had left but we spent the rest of the night there until the sun came up anyway, just in case. When he checked his iPod touch for the first time, right after we closed the door, it was 5 a.m. We started laying on the ground at 9 p.m. Eight hours had passed in what felt to us like no more than 40 minutes of time. Hours after we could start to see the sun through the treehouse slats, we went home. I no longer talked to this friend, but after this incident we discussed it, and we told everything from both of our points of view, and it all jived. We randomly brought it up to each other every few months and relived it, making sure that we were still on the same page about what happened and that we both remembered. I never spent the night out there again, and I didn't really even let myself stay out there past 5pm for a very long time. So, for slight context, I'm 22, and as my mom was pregnant with me, my grandfather passed away from lung cancer. The only thing he ever got me was this little clown doll that was supposed to hang over my crib. When you pull down the clown's legs, they stretch out, the whole body does, and it plays the little music box style song as it winds itself back up. The tune slowly stops over the course of about two minutes as the clown slowly goes back up to where it started. Now, I know this already sounds like a cheesy horror story setup, but stick with me. When I was a child, maybe seven or eight years old, I used to have the clown hanging from the metal curtain tiles back in my room, probably because I was too young to have read or watched it. But one night, 
My mom walked up the stairs and into my room while I was asleep because the clown was playing its song, but it hadn't had its legs pulled down. It apparently played for about five minutes, abruptly stopped and never wound down. I do remember that my mom had recorded it on her old flip phone and showed me in the morning. We found out later in the day that on that night, my great grandma had passed away. So my grandfather's mom. My mom is super adamant that it was her dad sending some sort of signal, but I would be interested to know what you guys think. This happened when I was in college. I had just gotten to school that morning, pretty normal day. Students were wandering around and chatting with one another. When I was nearing our building, I recognized a classmate from one of my subjects. We're not that close, but we greet each other. When our eyes met, I smiled at her. She didn't smile back. I thought that was really weird because she's a really bubbly girl. She was just standing across from the building. There were quite a few students around her too. I can still remember that she was wearing a yellow blouse and was holding something in her hands. She was literally just staring at me, poker face, while I proceeded to go inside the building. That's when it got weirder. Just as I rounded the corner, I saw her, but in different clothes and with a much happier attitude. I told her right away that I had just seen her outside, but she just laughed it off. She said that she had never been there. I knew she didn't have a twin sister. It was so weird, and I got really confused. I didn't know what I had experienced, or who or what I had seen, so I just headed to my classroom without telling anyone else about it. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to pick up some drinks. As we each threw out suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple of swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 p.m. First, we stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest, and then began heading toward the lake. I began to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning right behind the tree, I noticed a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat and a red coat on him. That sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. Sort of looked like a doorway. I didn't think twice to stick around and I tried to play it cool as if nothing happened and returned to my group. I never mentioned it to anyone, but can confirm, I think there are gnomes in San Francisco. The experience that I'm relaying here happened to one of my best friends who stays with his grandmother who's in her mid eighties. One day, her daughter picked her up and they went shopping together. My friend Rob went into his bedroom to watch TV right after they left. About a half an hour later, he heard some noise coming from the kitchen. So he poked his head out the door to see what it was. He saw his grandmother in the kitchen facing away from him, digging furiously through her junk drawer, obviously searching for something. He just shrugged and went back into his room. Another hour and a half passes and he comes out into the living room. That's when he see his aunt's van pull up to the house and his grandmother and aunt come in carrying all of her parcels. He then became uneasy and asked her if she found what she was looking for in the kitchen. She looked at him like he was nuts 
and said that she had been gone for hours and that she had never been looking in the kitchen drawer that day. He then explained that he had seen her and that whoever it was had on the exact same clothes and the same hair. He started laughing, thinking that she was just trolling him, but his aunt looked very concerned and verified that they had not returned after their initial departure. Rob began to freak out, and when he told me what happened later that day, he was glad that he didn't see its face, whatever it was. I believe him, because he's never told a story even remotely close to this one, and he seemed really unsettled by the whole incident. Honestly, I would be too. In our next story, Redditor Starry Alpha 2099 tells the story of the children they saw in the woods. At least, that's what they appeared to be. Here's the tale. When I was around 12 years old, I was at my cousin's house for a party. I'm pretty sure that it was around Christmas time. We were hanging out in their backyard and woods. Part of their backyard is a wooded area. And we came to this tree that used to have a tree house in it. All that's left of that tree house is some steps leading to it and a few platforms. It's not safe to get up on there, even if you can. My cousin, who was an eight-year-old boy at the time, told us this story about how the kids who had that tree house had died when it collapsed. I personally thought it was a bunch of BS, but I just went along with it. We eventually headed back to the house, but I decided to go back into the woods alone. As I was walking into the woods, I felt a strange sense of calm wash over me, like I was safe there, safer than anywhere else. As I'm walking, I'm looking around and I see a light blue and white checkered flag. It was up in a super thin tree that I hadn't noticed before. As I'm looking at this and trying to figure out how it got there, I started to hear kids' voices, laughing, talking, just having fun. I didn't think too much of it at the time, as my cousins were out in the treehouse, a, a new one that they had built, not the run-down one. As I'm walking closer to the old treehouse, the voices seem louder, and I look back up at the flag. It was billowing, despite there not being any wind. I shook it off as I couldn't feel wind from down there, but figured that maybe up where they were, there was a little. And that's when I saw them. Six children with white skin. Like snow white skin. Almost glowing. They all seemed to be wearing winter gear, though dull and dirty looking. They were walking toward me, but I didn't run. I wasn't afraid for some reason. I heard a branch snap and that's when I ran. As I went back toward my cousin's house, I was surprised to see that they weren't outside. I found them in the living room playing video games. When I asked them when they came in, they said, when you were walking in the woods, why? The kids I had heard weren't them. I still don't know to this day who those kids were. They weren't other neighbor kids. None of them lived close to my cousins. Were they just a figment of my imagination? Whoever it is, whatever they were, that incident is one of the reasons that I believe. from Virginia, and I currently live on the border of Virginia and West Virginia. My entire life I have experienced the paranormal, from dealing with ghosts and shadow people at a security job to dealing with an inhuman being at a retail job. I have seen it all, but lately I am experiencing something new. Being from the mountains, I have been aware of Haines and Bogans and of course the Fey folk. Thankfully, I've never had to deal with the latter, until now. 
As of late, I have started hearing small sing-song voices crying out, seen flashes of silver, and have noticed small knickknacks and collectibles disappearing and reappearing. I keep a broom at the front and back door. I circle my house with salt, and I use oil on every door frame, and I have a cross or a religious symbol in every room. I have a Judeo-Christian upbringing. Of interest, we literally live right next to a giant sinkhole that my neighbor has heard growling from before. I'm not really looking for advice for getting rid of anything or helping deal with it, since it's not really an issue and we don't necessarily feel threatened. I just thought it might be fun to share my experiences and see if anybody else also has experience with the Fae. Preston Castle, standing tall and alone in the plains of California, was originally constructed in the 1800s as a prison boarding school for troubled young boys. Now that the school has been closed, it serves as a historical and haunted location that offers walking tours of the castle. For my 16th birthday, instead of throwing some big sweet 16 party like most people would, I decided to take a friend of mine to Northern California, where we would explore as many haunted locations as possible and try to find evidence of ghosts. The Preston Castle was one such place we explored. My mom, my aunt, my best friend, for who the sake of anonymity will be called T, and I packed up our things and traveled north, arriving at the Preston Castle around 10 a.m. We entered the castle and decided to do the self-guided tour, which permitted us access to the first floor, the second floor, and the basement. The first floor was the least interesting of the three. When we entered the second floor, things started to get interesting. We came across a room filled with several children's toys, things like dolls, coloring supplies, and teddy bears. Using the EMF detector that I bought for the trip, I walked around the room to see if there were any changes in the electromagnetic field and came up with nothing. Then, when I was not moving, the meter spiked up to 12 when there was nothing in that same spot a moment before. I called my aunt over and showed her the reading while my mom and T moved on to the next room. While we stood there looking at the EMF, we noticed one of the crayons on the table begin to move on its own, despite the two of us being the only ones in the room. We both decided we should catch up to my mom and T. In the next room, we found T recording what she saw, a simple bedroom with a closet. Upon reviewing the recording later, we found a class three apparition. In the video, you can see a pale white arm sticking out of the closet that none of us could see when we were there in person. The rest of the second floor was pretty bland, aside from a few unexplainable spikes on the EMF meter. Unfortunately, she looked on her Snapchat later to see if she still had it, but today she doesn't have it saved to her memories and can't seem to find the footage. Finally, we arrived at the basement which was by far the scariest floor we were allowed in. The third and fourth floors were off limits to the public as the flooring was unsafe to walk on. We were walking through and we reached a room referred to as the chemical pool and it is exactly what it sounds like. Back when this was a boarding school, the boys that came to the school often had head lice or scabies. The solution the workers at Preston Castle came up with was to fill a pool with chemicals that could kill the lice and throw the boys in, forcing them to swim across. Several boys drowned or received injuries from the chemicals because of this. As we were looking upon the emptied chemical pool, I walked away from my group for a moment to scan the room with EMF. I was close to the corner of the room when the EMF spiked to 15 and I suddenly felt a hand tightly grip my thigh. 
I whipped around, expecting to see somebody from my group standing behind me. Perhaps they were trying to prank me, and we would laugh about it afterwards. But when I turned, there was no one there. My aunt called across the room, asking me what was wrong. I glanced down at my leg and saw a small white handprint on my thigh where I was grabbed. I explained to my group what had happened, but no one seemed to believe me until we were walking to the next room where my aunt suddenly jumped and spun around to look at us. She asked which of us had touched her neck, but none of us had. The final room we explored in the Preston Castle was the entrance room. It was here the boys would have to sign in, back when the castle was still in use. Stepping into this room, it was easy to feel the immense temperature drop. The castle had no power, therefore there was no reason that room should have been colder than any of the others. This put us on edge immediately, so naturally, I turned on the EMF. It was going crazy in there, giving us the highest reading that we'd gotten so far, which was 25. Obviously, we were freaking out about this, but we still wanted to explore more. Eventually, we decided that we weren't going to stay in there any longer. I was walking behind the rest of my group when an unexplainable, strong force pushed me into tea. That weekend was by far the scariest and most amazing birthday I have ever had. I have plenty of tales from that weekend, as well as other ghostly experiences that were not from that birthday. But those stories are for another time. This is a story of my first encounter with the paranormal that I can remember. I was about eight or nine years old, and I was playing with my little cousins at their parents' house during a family gathering. Behind their house is a large forest located in Northeast Florida. My cousins, their neighbor and I, were playing hide and seek in the forest. The only rule their parents had was to stay within sight of the house. Of course, we didn't listen. I was getting bored of the game, and I wanted to do some exploring. I convinced the other kids to join me as we headed deeper into the forest. I noticed this ball of light floating in midair. I thought I was seeing things. I remember rubbing my eyes just to make sure that it wasn't in my head. I asked my cousins if they saw it too, and when I pointed it out, they confirmed that it was there. It was bright and bobbed back and forth, changing from a yellowish color to a transparent green hue. We followed it for, I can't remember how long, but we reached a small cabin and the orb disappeared. It was dusk at this point and curiosity got the better of me. My cousins and the neighbor kid were too scared to go up to it. But I did, and I peeked inside the window. I saw a dim light inside, and what I thought was a human skull sitting on a table next to some jars. Then a shadow from within moved across the far wall. I got chills and signaled to the other kids to run back the way we had come, and I took off immediately behind them. We ran as fast as we could, and we didn't stop until we were inside the house and I locked the door behind us. I remember getting in trouble because our parents couldn't see us from the kitchen window. I didn't tell my mom or anyone else what we saw because I didn't want to scare my cousins or worry our parents. To be frank, I'm not even sure what I saw or if what I think I saw was there. Later that night, I woke up to the sounds of helicopters and dogs barking outside. It was well past midnight, and I asked my mom, who was standing in the kitchen with the rest of the adults, what was going on. The adults had stayed over after the party, and they were all just standing there, their eyes glued to whatever was happening in the backyard. I stood there and tried to peek through the kitchen window with them. 
My mom says that they found the body of a woman in the forest and a cabin where her killer was staying. There was a manhunt going on. I remember not being able to sleep for the rest of the night. The glaring white lights that shine through the folds of the blinds from the helicopter was only one of the reasons. I'm still not sure what that orb was. Maybe it was the spirit of the woman who was trying to lead someone to her killer, or maybe it was something more nefarious. I'm not even sure if one of the other kids told anyone about the cabin that we had seen. Maybe they did, and maybe one of their parents called the police. I just remember us not being allowed to even go near the tree line anymore whenever we visited after that night. I never wanted to anyway. I'm 24 now and have had many other experiences since then, but this is the one that I actually forgot about and was reminded of recently when reading up on Will-O-Wisps. I just thought I would share where it all began for me. I think it was maybe three years ago when this happened. I remember that it was winter because it was really cold and snowy outside. I was left alone in my family and I's cabin while the others went Christmas shopping for food, last minute packages for some friends and something else. I don't really remember exactly why they went out, but that's not so important. My point is that I was all alone in our cabin I was playing some games on my phone and listening to some music on the radio in my room on the first floor of the cabin. I remember that I suddenly got cold and went to get a blanket that was on our sofa. Just when I was about to get up and grab the blanket, I saw some kind of shadow in my peripheral vision. I didn't really care that much because I thought maybe it was just my imagination playing tricks on me because I didn't really like being alone in general, especially not in a cabin on a mountain in the middle of winter. I got the blanket and went back to my room to play some more games. About an hour passed and I had nearly forgotten all about the strange shadow, but then I saw it again. And this time it stayed in my peripheral vision for about three to five seconds before it went away again. I got a little creeped out about it, since I was the only one in the cabin at the moment, so I decided to lock the door to my room. Right after I locked the door, I heard some kind of crying upstairs on the second floor of the cabin. At first I thought it was my little sister, who was about three years old at the time. She used to cry a lot. I asked out loud, what's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? I heard her answer. Yes, I fell while playing with my dolls. Can you come upstairs and help me? I unlocked my door and headed toward the stairs. When it finally hit me, I was alone in the cabin. So whatever was upstairs was not my little sister. I sprinted out of the cabin wearing only a t-shirt and my dad's slippers, and it was freezing cold outside. I stopped running about 150 meters away from the cabin and looked at it from a distance. In one of the windows on the second floor, I could see a shadow just standing still. And even though I couldn't make out any eyes, I got the feeling that it was staring at me. I stood there outside of my family's cabin in the freezing cold for maybe about 30 minutes, and I cried until my family finally arrived. My mom and dad asked me what was wrong, but I didn't want them to think I was crazy so I just made up a story. I don't remember what I told them, but they seemed concerned about me. One thing I remember is that I talked my mom and dad into driving me to my grandparents' cabin because I refused to enter ours. Ever since that day, I refuse to join my family when they go to our family cabin. It's really hard to explain, but the feeling that I got that day in the cabin can only be described as unwanted like someone or something wanted to harm me. I still have nightmares about that shadow figure thing, even today. It's haunting my dreams.
I was out walking the woods at an ungodly hour of the morning. I believe it was around one to two in the morning. Last year, I was working at a church youth camp in Wisconsin. The camp was on two sides of a highway and a tunnel under the highway connected the two sides of the camp so that the campers could more readily access the other side. My then girlfriend and our friend liked to walk the woods at night after we were done with work. The first time we had done this, we were scared shitless by a fox barking. The deer in the woods were fairly docile and didn't spook easily. We soon learned to identify the sound of the fox and we saw it several times. One night, it was just me and my ex-girlfriend walking through the woods. As we rounded a corner in the trail, I noticed movement in the field by the tunnel gray shapes. I assumed they were deer, and I pointed them out to my girlfriend. We continued our walk past the tunnel. Just as we passed the entrance to the tunnel, maybe about 20 yards, we heard the most horrendous screeching. It sounded as if somebody was being strangled. It did not sound at all like the fox, but we shrugged it off. We continued up the road. All of a sudden, I had this weird feeling and I turned around to see a tall figure standing in the road. It was dressed in white and it was all hazy. I wondered if I was a little too tired and was seeing things. So I poked my girlfriend and asked her to take a look behind us. She immediately noticed it too. Something we both noted was that our eyes kept sliding off the figure. It was like we couldn't keep our vision centered on it. I was thinking this and she voiced it without me saying anything to her. I pulled my hunting knife from its sheath, but I somehow knew that it wouldn't do anything. Without looking away from the thing, I said, let's go, now. We backed away and then started running, and we didn't stop until we were back to the cabins. When I got back inside the cabin, the guy in the bunk next to me was still up texting his girlfriend. I quickly told him what I had seen. He looked at me and said, that's why I don't go out at night. I never went back out into those woods at night again, and when I talk about this, I still get chills and a nervous feeling. We had no drugs or alcohol, we were both under 21, and we were working at a church camp with strict policies, so I have no idea what we saw. So something just happened in the basement and I thought I'd tell you about it. Here's a little house layout to help a bit. Our living room has two ways to enter, one from the kitchen and one from the front door. The staircase leads right down to the front door. The way to the living room from the front door has you pass a hallway that has closets and the door to the basement. So it's 1.39 in the morning and I'm done scrolling through social media and decide to sleep. However, I want to cuddle with my kitty while I rest. I have a kitty sleeping on the headboard, but she's so peaceful I don't want to interrupt her. So I decide to head down to the main floor to find one of my other two cats. Down the stairs, I see my fluffy Newfoundland dog sleeping by the front door as usual. I decide to take the way through the kitchen to grab a snack. Then I come into the living room and I see my other cat sleeping in their cat tree. They look so peaceful, I decide it would be rude if I let one sleep and took the other one to cuddle with. So I let them sleep and started my way back into my room through the hallway. As I come to the archway from the living room to that hallway, the basement door slams all the way open hitting a table that we have behind it. I'm scared out of my mind and immediately turn around to go the way through the kitchen. As I approach the front door, I pet my dog and I remember thinking, maybe I'll see a ghost down the hallway. I can take a peek. My biggest fear is ghosts and demons, so I have no idea why I did this. I don't even walk to the hallway. I just peek around the wall. The basement door is swaying back and forth gently. I get even more scared and run to the top of the stairs, into my room, shut the door, pull up Reddit, and basically now dreading the fact that I have to pee because I don't want to leave my room. 
I want to say that it's the air conditioning, but down that hall, there are no vents. The only vent is in the laundry room, which is past a weirdly long hallway, and it has a door. I have no idea what could have made that door do that. I took my super skeptic boyfriend on our first camping trip up to the Mount Adams area because I'd heard of some spooky UFO action in the area. We hadn't been dating that long. We saw some UFO action that defied his skeptic explanations in a dispersed spot, but nothing I hadn't seen before. Lights appearing out of nowhere, zipping along and then disappearing, lights appearing and joining up and then disappearing, stuff like that. It was pretty satisfying to hear him say, yeah, I have no idea what that was. A few months later, we were camping with his dad and stepson, who were both longtime veterans in the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management. We mentioned the spots where we had camped, and his stepdad, who is not a believer of anything like this, said that the area we'd been in had been his beat for years. Without any prompting from us, he said, we were supposed to be up there looking for camp thieves. We never caught any thieves, but we saw a lot of weird stuff in the sky. When I pressed him for details, he got a little cagey, but he did tell a really creepy story about how these big black logging trucks with no lights would appear and steal lumber in the middle of the night. So he and his partner staked out one night to catch them. They were backed into the bush and had to sit in complete silence to let the truck cool down so nobody could detect them with heat or night vision goggles. The back of the truck was deep in the bush, meaning that only the forest was behind them. Then, after over an hour of sitting in silence, these huge bright lights appeared behind them, from deep within the forest. They were so bright he could see the entire outline of the truck, the antenna, the spotlights, and their silhouettes in the shadow. This was the early 80s, so we're not talking LED lights here. He said that he'd never seen anything like it. Then the lights went out, and everything was silent. No truck noise, no rustling in the forest behind them, nothing. I love the guy, but he has the imagination and personality of a potato. So there's no way he made this up. That's why it was so creepy and believable to me. He had a few other stories too that I'd love to get more information on. I, for one, believe him. From 2013 to 2019, I worked in outdoor education at many different summer camps and outdoor education centers in Canada, mostly Ontario, but I did spend a season in the Rocky Mountains. Having grown up going to sleepaway camp and eventually participating in month-long leadership programs with backcountry canoeing components, I was well prepared to lead a group of teen girls from a camp in Georgian Bay on a two-week camping trip in the Temagami region during my first year as a counselor. The Temagami region is located between North Bay, Sudbury, and Timmins, Ontario. This region is home to many provincial parks, wonderful hiking and canoeing routes, and the Bear Island Indian Reserve. Our route was fairly typical and beginning in the Whitefish Falls region, ending at Highway 11 after 14 days of paddling portaging, hiking, and campfire making. We had a satellite phone to check in with our camp director every day, and in case of emergency. We also had multiple exit points along the route. Until our second to last night, we were having fun and a relatively uneventful time, other than some mild dehydration and the usual bumps and bruises. Near the end of our trip, we were doing some free camping on the shore of an uninhabited island in Bear Lake which is recognized as part of the Bear Island Indian Reserve. It's a beautiful area, and we were across from the main island that the majority of the 250-person population inhabits. 
we had put out the fire and gone to bed. When about an hour after falling asleep, I was jarred awake by the sound of a loud motorboat. Obviously, this isn't that weird because it's a large lake and many people use boats to reach the mainland or their homes on secluded islands. However, it was around 11 p.m. and things had been quiet for the last few hours. The motor cut out and I could clearly hear the sounds of an argument. It sounded like at least one man and a woman and they were very angry and yelling at each other although I couldn't hear anything specific because they were too far offshore. Suddenly, the woman screamed and I heard a splash in the water. And then, total silence. At this point, I was pretty freaked out and hoping to God that my girls hadn't woken up. But I wasn't that lucky because I could immediately hear talking from their tent and I could tell that they were scared. I was about to unzip my door and look out to see if maybe the boaters had had an accident or something when the whole tent lit up. The light slowly panned across me and on to the tent my girls were in, which immediately made them quiet. In a normal volume, I was able to tell them to stay absolutely still. The light panned back onto my tent and then over to theirs again. I can only guess that it must have been some sort of boat with a searchlight on it. After an eternity that was really only about five minutes, the light was turned off and I heard the motor engage and fade as the boat went away from us. I immediately found the satellite phone and called our camp director, who gave us the phone number for the local police. I called them and they said that they would forward the information that I had given to the local native detachment on Bear Island. I don't think any of us slept that night, and I got up at 5 a.m. to take my canoe out and take a look around. I thought maybe somebody had fallen overboard and had managed to swim ashore. Obviously, I didn't find anyone, and there was nothing floating in the water either, although it is a pretty deep body of water. None of us wanted to camp one more night, so I called the camp and had them head out to the pickup point a day early. We paddled like hell and didn't really talk much. I think that none of us wanted to speculate about what we might have heard and what might have happened if we had made a noise or moved when that light was on our tents. I've thought about this a lot over the years, but whenever I've told people the story, they've been quite skeptical. I recently started looking into missing person cases in the area, but without much luck. Regardless of what we heard, something bad happened that night, and I'm just glad that nothing bad happened to us. For my lady's birthday, I took her to Gatlinburg, a popular, touristy, one main boardwalk town in the Smoky Mountains of Tennessee. We camped the first night a few miles out in the woods at a popular location, Elkmet Campground. The campground was beautiful, tall green trees like baby redwoods, a clear water river scattered by checkered rocks, families with little ones running around. It was great. Through borrowing a tent, we found that we had no stakes and headed into town for supplies, whiskey, and hot dogs. It was dusk by the time we made it back to the campground. Most campers were surrounding their dissipating fires or cleaning up before the quickly coming night. Our tent was still up, but crunched up a little without the stakes allowing it to spread open as widely as it could. We fixed our tent and started a fire. As our night progressed, we found ourselves surrounding our campfire two to three hours later around midnight. Now, this was the sort of campground where another campsite is just 30 yards from yours. Bears frequent the area, and my girlfriend was already freaking out a little bit, which is why I booked our site in the dead center of the whole campground. All the other campers had gone to bed at this point, and the only sound we could hear was the slowly crackling fire and the light stream of the river flowing into the rocks. The clouds were covering a crescent moon, so there wasn't much light to begin with. We had flashlights, and I would occasionally shine the light around us while avoiding hitting the other campers, 
to confirm that we were fine and that there were no bears. Seemingly out of nowhere, from the campsite behind my girlfriend and to my left, a light shined directly on us and then all around in a frantic yet focused manner, kind of like the Eye of Sauron. I saw what appeared to be a man with the strangest gait I've ever seen. He wore a headlight and was focused on his picnic table. The man's gait seemed to me to be a little bit like Jar Jar Binks, just not normal. I could see through my periphery that the man focused his light on the picnic table, and whenever I turned my head toward him, immediately his light would hit my girlfriend and I. I could only see the outline of the man through the light of his headlight and the occasional flash of my light at his campsite once he continued to flash his light at ours in a very disconcerting way. This was the campsite across from us, where we saw no one at all the night prior. I could only see the outline of his body as all black, as if he was in an all black bodysuit. His movements were eerily repetitious. For what went on to close to an hour, this man would shine his headlight on his picnic table, make limited motions with his hands, if any at all, then walk five steps back to his tent, shine his headlight at his tent, then walk back to the picnic table, shine his light at us, and repeat it all over again. If this was just the man looking for something, he was on a cocktail of drugs. Once his light was on us for too long for comfort, I shined my flashlight on him for an extended period of time. It was at this moment when I went from annoyed to fight or flight. A chill ran down my back as I saw the outline of the man disappear in front of me and the light from his headlight bounce down to the ground, then fly across the ground from his campsite. It seemed to jump along the ground and into the bushes diagonally from both of our campsites. It wasn't like the headlight had been thrown, but as if it ran across the ground like if it was on the head of a dog. I took my flashlight away and watched his light slowly come back out of the bushes and climb back up to the height of a person. The shadow figure returned back, walking out of the bushes and back to the campsite to continue the same odd behavior. There were no sounds at all coming from this figure throughout the entirety of the night. Sometime later, we went into the tent for shut-eye, and the shadow man figure was still at his odd routine. The following day, the tent from the shadow man's campsite was gone, like no one had ever been there. I then found out that just a mile from our campsite was a small town called Elkmont Ghost Town, with abandoned buildings and a cemetery up a trail a bit. I couldn't find any other stories of Elkmont mysteries, but I wouldn't be surprised if there are other stories involving the Headlight Man. This happened around the time that I was 11 years old. My dad had just bought a log cabin in the woods of Maine. The place was completely dead, and while we had neighbors, we rarely saw them. We had already spent a few nights up there on a previous trip, about a 250 mile trip just to get there. We decided to take another trip up there for a long weekend. As this cabin was old, my parents decided to get some work done on it to make it more appealing. So they hired people to come and redo some things in the rooms. At the time, there was only one bedroom available for us to sleep in. As night fell, we all got ready to sleep. There were six of us in that one room. Mom, Dad, me, two brothers, and sister. In the middle of the night, I wake up to audibly clear boot steps in the living room. The bedroom was connected to the living room. All that was between us was an old wooden door and a rusty deadbolt lock that would definitely come off if somebody were to kick the door in. As I was still waking up, I was in that foggy state that you are kind of when you're just becoming conscious. I wasn't all there. But then I heard the voice of my sister saying, do you hear that? So now I know that this isn't just part of a dream leaking into reality. 
I sit up quickly and look to the other bed, and both of my parents and my sister are looking at the door and looking at each other. My heart starts to race, not knowing what to think. I then hear my sister say, are we going to die? Which really doesn't help the situation at hand. As my other brother starts waking up, the boot steps stop for a moment and then continue. Mind you, there was no fading of the steps, which means that the sound came from a general area. We continue to just look at each other in fear and worry none of us knowing how or why somebody would get into our cabin. As my last brother begins to wake up, the boot steps stop. My dad then gets out of bed and grabs the machete that he placed under the bed and heads toward the door. Placing his ear to the door slowly to try to see if he can hear anything else, he can't. Then, in one quick motion, he unlocks and opens the door while wielding his weapon, prepared for anybody that might be there. He walks out into the living room, then to the other rooms to see if anything was there. But everything was clear. As a matter of fact, all the doors and windows were locked. There was no possible entry into the cabin, seeing as nothing had been tampered with. It was really hard to get back to sleep that night. As I woke up that morning, I remembered what had happened the previous night. I remembered hearing those boot steps, and I even confirmed with my family that it wasn't a dream and that we all experienced the same thing. As there was no possible way that a person could have entered the house, I came to the conclusion that this was paranormal. I had my share of paranormal experiences growing up. My family and I have tried to debunk this a hundred ways, but we just can't come up with a solid solution. If you think you have a reasonable cause for this incident, let me know. And before somebody says it was somebody outside or an animal, no. I know for a fact that the boot steps came from inside the house. This was definitely one of the scariest experiences of my life. About two years ago, my husband and I took our five kids to a water theme park in Idaho. We live in Washington State. We borrowed my dad's trailer and truck and thought it would be less expensive and more fun if we camped at a campground down the road rather than the one made for the park. I've driven through Idaho before and so has my husband, but we've never stayed there before. To preface my experience, I have had nightmares on occasion where I felt like something was trying to possess me. I always end up reciting the Lord's Prayer or yelling or something. I'll be honest, sometimes it takes a couple of tries and I always have my husband wake me up because I'm screaming. I regularly pray for protection, wear protective crystals, and ask my guardians for protection also. I feel as though because I regularly research and read into the paranormal, it's best to take precautions. So here we are at this campground. The first night, everything was great. Nothing happened. The next day, we take the kids to the park, spend all day there, and come back to cook dinner and get ready for bed. I also must say, while I have read a lot about sleep paralysis, I have never experienced it until this night, and I have not since. Once we were all in bed, I started to fall asleep. While asleep, I feel awake. I can see the trailer around me in kind of what felt like a blur, but I'm unable to shout or scream or move. I look to the end of my bed and see what looks like a short, four foot tall or so demon-like thing. It has horns and it's difficult to make out its face and it's terrifying. All of a sudden, I feel my husband grab my arm and I'm awake. He says, you were screaming. Are you okay? I told him I was fine and tried to go back to sleep. But the same thing happened again, except this time the demon was closer to me. 
I remember shouting in my head, Jesus is my savior, go away, but he wouldn't. I remember trying to scream for my husband, but I couldn't. Then once again, my husband grabs my arm and wakes me up, saying I'm still screaming. At this point, I still told him I was fine. I attempted to sleep once more, and the same thing happened again and again, and every time, the demon thing was even closer. No matter what I tried, he wouldn't leave, and again, my husband would wake me up. Eventually, I told him what was going on. He said he was sorry. This time, I didn't try to fall back asleep. I wrapped as much of him as I could around me and desperately tried not to sleep. I felt like something was trying to pull me towards sleep, but I fought it. Next thing I know, I woke up the next morning and told my husband the entire story. I have never researched the area. I can't remember the name of the campground. Because I was so terrified, I haven't really shared this story until recently. In the summer of 2019, I became fixated on this ruined castle hidden deep within the woodlands, a day's cycle from where I lived. It is by no means easy to access. We often rode our bikes there, and there was a lot of lugging them through the mud, up hills, and down hills that were too narrow for a bike. Every week in June, my buddy and I would ride out to this castle pack lunch, and make a day out of it. I still have fond memories of those cycles. The castle itself harbored an underground chamber that could be accessed by a small tunnel, leading you into this subterranean room that was strewn with rock and plastered with graffiti. I haven't been to the castle in a while now, but if I remember correctly, some of the graffiti read things like no one leaves and Satan is good. Now is probably a good time to mention that the castle has a long past with rituals and so-called devil worshipping. I've had three peculiar happenings at the castle, and I suppose I'll tell them from least likely to be paranormal to most likely. It was by no means a summer day. The sun made the occasional appearance, but mostly remained hidden by clouds. To me, it seems like the way to get to the castle is always guarded by an unholy amount of mud, even if it hadn't rained for days. So our bikes would always be splattered by the time we got home. Once under the shaded canopy of the trees and with the mud far behind us, we approached the ruins with the same amount of giddiness we always did. Our giddiness was shattered though, when we heard the sounds of children floating down from the ruins. We liked having the castle to ourselves, which in hindsight is pretty selfish. But upon arrival, we found that no children, no families, nobody at all was present. This struck us as odd, seeing as the castle sits on a hill. We ruled out that any family would dare venture down the steep slopes, especially if they had children. And we never heard any children's voices again. The second incident was when I was waiting outside the entrance of the tunnel, about to duck down and head inside, when I heard a sharp whistle right beside my ear. It was as if somebody had placed their mouth mere centimeters from my ear and whistled. The third and final incident was when we brought candles to the castle to take some nice photos of the illuminated chamber. The chamber itself is littered with dried leaves and being paranoid that a rogue spark from the match could potentially cause a fire, we lit them outside and carried them in. On the fourth or fifth candle, while I was lighting a match, there was a thunderous hiss from inside, so loud that I often tell people it was as if a giant snake was in there. Fearing that something had caught fire, I rushed in to find everything the way it was. No fire, with the candles flickering silently. Those are the three occurrences that I've had a hard time explaining. I've been to the castle since, but nothing out of the ordinary has happened. I'm sure I'll be returning to the castle soon now that summer has once again rolled around. So, who knows?
Maybe I'll have more stories then. There's this forest near my house in the southeast of England that my friends and I use for mountain biking. But it's got this very uncomfortable, strange vibe to it. The only person we ever see here is the same older man walking his dog. But he always appears when we're feeling really uneasy due to the energy. He'll suddenly just walk past and you never see him coming. There's a tree that has become a memorial for a dog that died, coincidentally a German Shepherd, the same breed as the man has and looks very similar too. Sometimes in the farthest corners of the woods, I distinctly hear a dog collar behind me or nearby. Here's where things get a bit strange. There's a spot we use for campfires and drinking. We were there late at night, around 9 to 10 p.m but gradually began feeling creeped out as the energy started to increase. We started hearing a very strange noise. It was definitely not a fox or a bird. It sounded very sweet and innocent at first until it turned into a blood curdling shrieking. We quickly packed our stuff and went on a mission to get the hell out of Dodge. There's a field that serves as the main access point to the woods. We were using the main path through it and got an overwhelming sense of dread, sadness, and almost anger all mixed together. In the bushes to the side of the path, we heard running, very heavy running. And all of a sudden we started hearing the most horrible growling and screaming noises, getting worse and worse until we got to the exit of the field and it all stopped. We didn't hear it run away but all the noises and running just stopped. We all had strange dreams that night. One time I heard very heavy running footsteps in the bushes right behind me while my friend was having a pee. I turned around to see if it was him, but there's no way it was because he hadn't moved from his spot. He came back and asked if I had heard the running too. Two days ago, I went back there for the first time in around five months alone, as I moved away from the local area. The strange feeling was still there, and in some areas felt like it had gotten worse, but I didn't let it bother me. I went back again today, and there was heavy rainfall the last couple of days, so the ground is very muddy. I kept hearing the dog collar that follows me around, and I noticed strange hoof marks in the ground but they were very inconsistent. Groups of them would appear and then there wouldn't be any more until 15 to 20 meters up the path. They definitely weren't there two days ago and these woods take so long to get into, many people wouldn't bother going there and it's impossible to get a horse in there. I have a few theories about this forest. One, I think it could be a similar presence to Goatman as he was often linked to canine deaths. The potential cryptid activity and hoof marks are consistent with this theory. Two, very unlikely but plausible, it could be the devil's hoof marks. The presence feels very demonic. Third, the forest is potentially a dumping ground for bodies. There was a suspected murder in the local town and police searched the woods. It would explain the strange presence but not the cryptid activity. Or four, People with dirt bikes sometimes use the forest. Maybe one of them could have died there and haunts us. People have told me that it's just a deer, but that is impossible. We don't get them around these parts at all. I've literally never seen one. I just have no idea what it is that we witnessed. This happened to me a while back when I decided to go on another camping trip alone. I always liked camping alone. 
There's something serene and sobering about being isolated in the middle of the wilderness, and I always found it relaxing. So I planned out what trail I was going to take, packed my camping gear and my rifle for protection, and jumped in the truck. I get to this trail early in the morning, and I hike about 15 to 20 miles in until I find the right spot. I head off the trail to find a place to put my tent up. I stumble upon this nice sized clearing and decide that it's a nice, beautiful spot to settle down. I am exhausted at this point, but I set up the tent at the southernmost edge of the clearing next to the tree line, and I manage to get a fire going. I roast some hot dogs and start to hear a sound in the distance beneath all the forest noise. It sounded like an animal, mostly like a deer, with a lame leg because it sounded like the animal was making a walking, dragging noise. I felt bad for the poor guy, but it was too far away and it was getting dark, so I couldn't really go find it to put it out of its misery. I think nothing else about it after that and I go on eating my food. After I eat, I douse the fire and crawl into my tent and get into my sleeping bag. I decide that even at my exhausted and relaxed state, I can't go to sleep. So I pull out a book that I brought with me and start to read by the light of my lamp. Hours go by and I hear that sound again, this time closer, right at the opposite side of the clearing. Surprised, I put my book down and listen to this animal walk drag across the clearing toward my tent. It's really loud at this point and it now sounds like the hooves are all being heavily planted with dragging noises following seconds after, almost like the deer is dragging something along. It makes it to about what I assume is the middle of the clearing and stops. I hear nothing, no breathing. I mean, not a sound from this animal. I unzip the tent and I look into the clearing, nothing but trees and darkness. What the hell? Unnerved at this point, I zip the tent back up and I sit there listening for other noises. Nothing, just the crickets and the breeze. I decide that there are a lot of strange noises in the woods and just tried not to let it bother me. Besides, I had my rifle. I start to doze off when I hear men's laughter off in the distance to my right then women's laughter and stick snapping far off to my left. I'm up now, wondering if what I'm hearing is really what I'm hearing, or if it's just the product of being half asleep. I hear more faint laughing from a couple of other different directions, all different, old men, old women, younger adults, even children, and I confirm that it's real. The noises are closing in, so I grab my rifle preparing to fire off a warning shot into the air in case they came too close. Something about this laughter, how far in I was, the noise earlier and the time of night, told me that this was not just another family strolling through. I was on edge enough already, but then I noticed something. The nightlife was dead quiet. Not even the wind was making any noise. I decided that enough was enough. I unzipped the tent and fired a single shot into the night. I sat there and surveyed the tree line and saw nothing. I listened intently to my surroundings, no laughing, and the forest sounds had returned. Relaxing just a bit and figuring that I had scared whoever was there off, I sat down and in my exhausted state, I fell asleep. I woke up later in a cold sweat, racked with anxiety, and it was still dark outside. I immediately hear two people whispering not far from my tent. Alert, I grabbed my rifle and tried to listen to what they were saying. I couldn't make out much, but I heard something about being lost. So I shouted, hey, who's there? The voices fall silent. I shout again. Are you guys lost? Who's there? Suddenly a huge burst of flame, like a flamethrower, erupted from the middle of the clearing, illuminating several silhouettes of people just standing around. 
In shock, I fire my rifle, blowing a hole in the front of my tent, and it goes dark. Without checking my surroundings, I get up and sprint out of my tent, making a hard left back to where the trail was. I hiked until sunrise back to my truck, with my head over my shoulder the entire way. I never heard anybody following me. I never saw anyone or anything the whole way, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After that, my enjoyment of camping alone left me like I left all my gear in the woods that night, and I've never done it since. It was winter of 2017, around December. I was camping with friends right outside of a Native American reservation near St. George, Utah. None of us are native, but we were trying very hard to be respectful of the land. We set up an A-frame and every night we packed in like sardines. I was on the outside and my buddy Seth was next to me. Coyotes are pretty common in this area of the country but they're pack animals who don't really engage with campers, so it's very common to hear them, but not as common to see them up close. However, every night that week, we saw this mangled old coyote, gray hair, blistering skin, probably on the edge of death. It walked with a limp in its front left paw, kind of like a dog that gets a pebble stuck in their paw. Anyway, we went to bed one night, and I was still on edge. Around 3.15, I woke up with a sharp pain in my ear. It ended up being a beetle burrowing in my ear, but that's not important. Anyway, I hit the side of my head, and I pressed my ear, and I was freaking out because it was this really acute pain that I had never felt before. I thought I was having an aneurysm or something. Anyway. I woke Seth up to have him shine a light in my ear. As soon as he woke up, he freaked out. Like, he was horrified. I was like, what is it? He reached above his head and gets a mirror, and he holds it up to me so that I could see behind myself. To my horror, there's a scraggly old man with gray hair, a huge tumor on the side of his face, torn up clothes, walking with a cane and a limp. He doesn't seem to be at all cognizant of us. It was almost as though he was in a different dimension. He didn't have a gun or anything, so we just clutched our knives and kept our eyes on him for the rest of the night. At one point, he just wandered away. The next morning, the two other people with us said that they both had a dream that this kid, Chris, who wasn't with us, was tied to a tree upside down and a massive silver glowing elk slowly but surely gutted him alive with its horns. They said the four of us and a few other friends all sat nude around the tree, not drumming or chanting, but almost like we were sacrificing him. They both had exactly the same dream and were able to independently draw the same picture down to the order that we were all sitting in to the number of branches on the tree without consulting each other. We texted Chris when we left, and he said he'd been up all night, throwing up, completely inexplicably. I don't know if we saw a skinwalker or what, but that was the weirdest experience of my life. I've never really had any paranormal experiences before, but I cannot explain this. I'm in college, and about seven other people and I from my school went on a backpacking trip. We had two experienced leaders. We drove to Zaleski State Forest, which is in the Appalachian region of Ohio. It was early April this year, and it was cold. Everything was still dead from winter. After hiking miles into the forest, 
we set up camp at the backpacking campsite. There were a couple of other groups of people as well. A few of them were friendly older couples and then two college-aged girls. Everyone was pretty spread out from each other. We set up camp farther away from everyone else. I've always been able to sense energies of places and the energy in this place wasn't great. It was almost spooky. Each of us had individual one-person tents and we formed a kind of cluster in this site with my tent being in the back, so no one was behind me. Our cluster was also right next to the forest because this backpacking site was like a big cleared off square in the middle of the trees. Fast forward, I'm dead asleep around 2 a.m. and I wake up to leaves crunching right by my tent. I hear footsteps walking in circles around my tent. They had a sort of heaviness to them that couldn't be a deer or a dog. Also, it sounded like it was bipedal. I could not make this up. This creature or thing was circling my tent for a long period of time, slowly creeping up to the sides of the tent and then just stopping for periods of time that seemed like forever. Then it would move on, walking around the rest of our tent cluster I could hear a human-like breathing from the mouth whenever it was close to my tent, like a sort of light heaving. I was shaking, too scared to unzip my tent and investigate. I kid you not, this went on for hours, and it seemed to me like I was the only one awake. Out of nowhere, I see an illuminated light shape from my tent, although I couldn't tell what it was from inside my tent because it was all zipped up. It was like a warm glow and it didn't move, kind of like a flashlight would if you were holding it still. I was paralyzed in fear. I simply couldn't believe that it was an animal. At some point, probably due to sheer exhaustion, I fell asleep, but I could hear the heavy footsteps circling right up until the point that I did. In the morning, I questioned my fellow campers about it and my leader admitted that she had heard the footsteps and the noises as well, admitting that it was bizarre and that she would have investigated had she not been so groggy. One of the boys in the group said that he also noticed the light that came on, but thought that it was someone else. Not a single person in the group had gotten up to go to the bathroom or turned on a light that night. I've heard things about the Appalachian region being creepy and bizarre, and now I believe it. Some people on Reddit have leaned toward Bigfoot because apparently he's associated with light orbs. I've never really been a Bigfoot believer, but I'm telling you, this didn't feel like just any animal or person or anything I've ever experienced before. So maybe Bigfoot is as good an explanation as any. I actually overheard this on the news a few years back about a cryptid in Kentucky. It's a feline-like creature said to look like a mountain lion mixed with some sort of monstrosity. I didn't really think much about it until my friend, we'll call him Bran, told me what he saw when he was deer hunting. It was pretty late and he and his dad were about to pack up. They heard a low growl near them. His dad told him to get back up in the hunting perch. I'm not a hunter by any means, so don't crucify me for not knowing the correct lingo. Bran did and watched through his binoculars to watch for what had made the growl or for his dad to give him an all good. He watched for what he said might have been 10 to 15 minutes when movement caught his eye. He tried to get a better look when he saw the weird creature that I mentioned earlier. It scared him so badly that he froze. He thought it was just a mountain lion or a bobcat, but it had four eyes. His dad managed to distract it off by startling a nearby doe. It left chasing its newfound prey. 
He and his dad waited until they couldn't hear it and then booked it back to their truck. He was pretty shaken up the whole week after. I felt bad for him. However, this wasn't his only run-in with a cryptid or a strange creature. Despite being underage, he still does a lot of dangerous or stupid things, such as drinking and driving, smoking cigarettes, and other really dumb things. He's not shy about it either. Well, he'd been doing that first one, but wasn't totally drunk yet, and his best friend, we'll call him Dave, was taking a joy ride with him on some back roads, which aren't hard to find in our region. They were messing around, having a good time, blaring music, you know, teenager things. He was focusing on the road, listening to a story Dave was telling him, when he saw a strange, pale, humanoid, quadrupedal, fleshy creature with visible teeth and large black eyes run out onto the road. Bran hit his brakes and just barely missed it. It screeched at him and ran off into the woods on the other side of the road. Bran and Dave sat there trying to process what had happened and if what they both saw was real. They stopped drinking and went straight back to Dave's house, where they proceeded to freak out. They told me this story, too, as I sat next to them in a couple of classes. While I asked them to describe the creature to me, as I'm known for researching and collecting information on cryptids, urban legends, and monsters, they felt I could help. After they gave me the description, I came up with a list of possible creatures and showed them art and, quote, real pictures of them on Bran's phone. Once we got to Wendigo's, Skinwalkers, and the Rake, they showed clear signs of distress. I pulled up one of the well-known Rake pictures and showed it to them. I thought Bran was going to have a heart attack. He yelled, That's it. It has to be. It's almost dead on. Dave scrolled through the related pictures and found a different photo and quietly showed both of us. Bran then fell silent. They both said that that was it. That was the creature they nearly hit. I told them that they had to be bullshitting me because the rake is a creepypasta. I told them the story and what it's known for and that they were not proven to be real and were in fact very likely fake. But they insisted that that's what they saw. They thanked me and asked me if there was a way to protect themselves if it came for them. I told them I didn't know, but fire was probably the best route if it actually was real. They haven't had any experiences since that I know of, but it did freak them and me out a good amount. I was glad I could help them, but now I'm terrified of the woods, more than I previously was, and I question more and more if these legends are just legends. I already believed in a few, but it's just terrifying to think that more of them could be real. Bruce's castle and cave on Ratlin Island is full of countless ghost stories and legends from local fishermen, hikers, and tourists. The island was a known sanctuary and hiding place for centuries until Sir Francis Drake and Sir John Norrie overtook the island and castle. Those living on the island quickly surrendered, but Norrie's forces slaughtered the helpless 400 civilians and 200 castle defenders, including the sick, old, and young. Today, the castle is in ruins. People have reported hearing screams and cries coming from the old site. A ghostly figure of a man in old leather armor is often seen guarding the castle perimeter before he vanishes. One spirit attempts to interact with people. She is the brown lady and walks the castle grounds and approaches visitors as if she is trying to speak, but she never says anything before fading away. The cave on Ratlin Island is believed to be the most haunted place in Northern Ireland. It is thought to have been bewitched long ago by the pagans who first inhabited the island. People report hearing moans and whispers coming from deep within the cave. Legend says that the Scottish King Robert the Bruce and his men hid in the cave from the English after a brutal defeat, waiting for their forces to regroup during the First War of Scottish Independence. 
Robert the Bruce eventually defeated the English and was recognized as the true King of Scotland. According to local folklore, the king never died, but he and his men returned to the old cave and entered into an enchanted sleep, waiting until the day they will awake and unite the people of Scotland to defend against those who attack it. Recently, a group of fishermen settled into the cave to take a break and to make tea. As they gathered and poured their cups, a hand appeared out of the darkness and placed an extra cup out to be filled. The fishermen quickly poured their mysterious guest a cup, but were too afraid to look up and see what was lurking in the darkness. The hand disappeared back into the depths of the cave with its cup. Fairies regularly travel from Ratland Island to Ballycastle, where you will find another old haunted castle overlooking the sea, which has been turned into a hotel. Ballygally Castle is over 400 years old and is haunted by three very active spirits. The most well-known is Lady Isabella Shaw, the wife of Lord James Shaw, that only wanted a son so that he would have a proper heir. When Lady Shaw finally gave birth to a son, Lord Shaw took the baby from her and locked his wife in a tiny room at the top of the castle. One report says Isabella grew restless and possibly went insane in the room. She finally tried to escape, only to fall to her death. Others said that Lord Shaw, or someone he hired, threw Isabella out of the window at the top of the castle. Now, Isabella roams the castle in search of her baby. Guests hear strange noises, witness a mysterious green mist, and sometimes smell the old vanilla scent the lady was known to wear. She is most often seen in the tiny old room she was imprisoned in. Today, it has been fittingly named the Ghost Room, which guests can stay in if they so choose. Madame Nixon lived in the hotel during the 19th century and is thought to be the second ghost that roams the castle at night. Guests often report mysterious footsteps and glimpses of a phantom woman wearing a silk dress roaming the halls. The sound of a child running around, playing and laughing is often heard around the castle grounds, even when no guests have children with them. The restless child is known to play pranks on guests and staff. He loves to knock things over, unfold sheets and towels, so that unsuspecting staff will open locked rooms, only to mysteriously find them in disarray. Apparently, a medium stayed at Ballygally Castle, and one night she detected, quote, more spirits than there were guests staying in the hotel. This happened a few years ago, and it's something that I consider to be a paranormal experience. For context, I collect vintage clown dolls, and I'm a clown for hire myself. Clowns have been a big part of my life. I find clowns very comforting, so collecting older ones was always something that I've been excited about. I don't have very many clown dolls. Specifically, I collect sand clowns, usually. I have around eight or ten clown dolls, I think. So a few years back, I got a hold of a new sand clown among two others. I instantly had a very strong connection to the clown, and I would take him with me everywhere. In the car, around the house, that sort of casual thing. I think I even took him to school once in my backpack. I was in high school at the time. A little while after this, I started having dreams. I still remember them vividly in such high detail. I had the same exact dream every time, and I knew it was a dream. I was fully conscious during them. It didn't feel like a dream. It almost felt like it was real life somehow. I had these dreams back to back several times. The dream would be that I was in a house with wooden floors, wooden walls, and a wooden roof. At the end of the room that I was facing, there was one wooden chair with my clown doll sitting in it staring at me. There were two doors to the side of it, 
open with a little toy train track that ran through both of them. There were two doors on either side. The first dream, I just looked through all the doors, the two bedrooms, the standard sort of guest room, I suppose. And on the left, the first door was a little girl's room with a crib and some toys like bears. It was very sweet. The last room was a sort of sitting room, couches and a coffee table. When I came back, the clown was still there in the chair. I walked up to it and started talking to it, but nothing really happened. I did feel sort of unnerved, like there was a presence, and I never went through the two gateways because it was pitch black and it scared me. In most dreams, I feel some sort of progress towards something. These dreams never progressed or changed. It was the same room, the same clown, nothing going on, just a sense of unease, like I was being watched. So I kept getting these dreams every night, over and over, back to back. After a while, I start to get scared and I yell at the clown doll. I just sort of ask what I'm doing there and if it was haunted or something. I got really upset at this point. The clown's eyes looked side to side and it really freaked me out. In the last dream I had, I got mad and I told it to leave me alone and to never come back to bother me. I was really scared and started talking about some religious things because I was getting worried that it could have been a demon or a ghost at this point haunting me. I started getting really into it and a little train came out of the doorway and just ran around the track once, whistling a few times. The clown doll's eyes looked directly at me and he said something for the first time and I woke up. I can't remember what it was, I could never make it out. After this, I never had that dream again. I guess whatever I did made it leave, or not? I'm not really sure, honestly. I'm sure a lot of people would say, hey, this isn't supernatural. What are you, stupid? It's just a dream. But it's something that I felt, deep in my core, that this was supernatural, because I've never experienced anything like it. The clown doll is still one of my favorites. After the dreams, I actually feel more attached to it. These dolls mean a lot to me, and I have them on my desk, and I still take them with me places sometimes. When I hold them now, it almost feels like it fills me with a sense of calm. Sometimes I wonder if it does have some sort of spirit attached to it, but maybe it's just very good and helpful. I got this clown and went through this when I was going through recovery from extensive trauma, and they have helped me a lot in my recovery despite the weird and scary dreams. I almost feel like I know him, like we're friends. I know it sounds kind of weird, and I'm sure this isn't the most exciting story, but that's what happened to me. This story happened a long time ago, but I still remember it like it was yesterday, and so does my cousin. Our families were very close growing up. We were there often, usually just watching movies. We were young, and this was around the time that the killer clown thing was happening. So when we would watch movies, they would usually be horror, The Conjuring, Annabelle, etc. I was about 12 at the time. My cousin was 14, her brother was 12, and my brother was eight. We were in their basement one night while our parents and older siblings went out for the night. Babysitters weren't something we had. It was lock the doors, stay together, and don't answer the phone. My cousin's basement had a TV in the corner of the room, and on the same wall was a projector. My cousin, 12-year-old boy, and my brother had the hockey game playing on TV and Call of Duty on the projector, while my cousin and I, she was a 14-year-old girl, 
We're sitting shoulder to shoulder on the couch, back to the wall with our headphones in, watching videos on our phones. Our brothers decided they were hungry and turned on the lights as they went upstairs to find something to eat. My cousin and I sat for about five minutes before her brother's bedroom door in the basement slowly closed. When the door came to a full close, the lights in the room turned off, along with the projector and the TV. I paused the video that I was watching on YouTube and first assumed that it was a power outage as I didn't believe in ghosts. But when I checked my battery, I saw that my iPod was still charging. Before I could do anything, I heard the sound of my brother and cousin laughing, almost giggling behind my head, as if they were right behind my ear. But it sounded off. It didn't sound exactly like them. It creeped me out, and my head shot up and toward my cousin, who was already looking at me with her eyes wide. Like I said, we were backed up to a wall, so there's no way anybody could have been behind us. Neither of us missed a second to get up and run upstairs. The first thing we did when we got up there was to look at each other. I said, you heard it too? She agreed, explaining to me what she had heard, which was exactly what I had also heard. We walked toward the kitchen and saw her brother. We explained to him what had happened. He didn't believe us and told us that my brother had been on the third floor bathroom ever since they left and they didn't talk or laugh. This creeped out my cousin and I even more, and when he went downstairs, everything was turned back on and the bedroom door was open. We talk about that night every few years, and it still creeps us out to this day. I'm not sure if I'm haunted or something, but I do have a lot of ghost stories that started happening after that night. Kids that I babysit keep telling me that they see things around me, or similar things from that night will happen to me in my basement, with or without other people there. Whenever I tell people about these events, they seem to have something happen to them afterwards, and stories come back to me. Usually the ones who joked about what happened or didn't believe in it had an encounter. I think something followed me out of her basement that day, but I don't know if it's evil, if that's possible. I still can't really explain it. It's just odd. One night in the spur of the moment, my best friend, my girlfriend, and I went camping on the banks of a creek that I lived within five miles of. We grabbed a 20 pack of beer, some blankets, and some cigarettes, and headed out in my piece of shit van with a good spirit. It was about a week to 10 days before Halloween, so it got dark on us pretty quickly. We made haste and gathered firewood with flashlights, ignited a fire, which rapidly grew hot, and threw off a lot of light, which allowed us to gather enough wood to chill and drink a couple of beers. We broke out the boom box and commenced having a good time. A few hours went by very quickly, and my girlfriend went to the van to sleep, although I don't know how, as it was pretty cold away from the fire. Anyway, my friend's girlfriend got off work at midnight and brought us more beer, though we didn't need it, as we had only drank about half of what we had initially brought. Those two got in an argument and she left. We watched as her taillights faded into the night. Then the weird stuff started happening. This place wasn't in the middle of nowhere. It was secluded, but we could see farmhouses from where we were. It was far enough tucked out and cold enough where nobody would be screwing around anywhere near us. All of a sudden, my buddy goes, screw that woman, and turns up the radio as loud as it would go, but not for long. It was about that time that I heard what he was talking about, a distinct woman's voice from across the creek scream in a guttural way, help me. I looked across the fire at my buddy to see him look as pale and sheepish as I felt. He turned down the radio before I could say anything. Dude, did you hear that? He said. 
He grabbed his cell phone and we both grabbed flashlights and shined them across the creek. He called his girlfriend to make sure she didn't have car trouble down the road. She was already home. That was like a relief and more stress at the same time. It wasn't her, so who the hell could it be? We stood there in the grip of fear. Lights shined across the water. We didn't hear anything for what seemed like forever. Just when we were about to chalk it up to imagination or jitters or something, we hear, help me. A woman that couldn't have been a hundred yards away from where we were standing, which was right on the opposite bank of the creek from where we were. We quickly shone our lights to where the plea for help was coming from, but there was nothing there. We both called out, hello, where are you? Hello? No response ever came. Being experienced in the outdoors, we both knew that if she was being attacked or chased, there would be other noises we could hear, like rustling in the fallen leaves. Or, as close as it sounded, some more cries for help or twigs snapping or something. By this time, whatever buzz we had from the beer was long gone. We began gathering whatever we could grab and I woke up my girlfriend and commanded her to start the van and that we were leaving. She promptly did this and it's probably a good thing that she did because what came next still scares me to this day and is completely unexplainable. As we were piling in, we hear, help me come from the very back of the van, which was in the complete opposite direction of where the screams had been coming from. Needless to say, we left the beer and radio and got out of Dodge. I had my girlfriend get out of the way and I burned out, nearly wrecking the car in the process. I drove the dirt road about 60 all the way out. This happened in October of 2002 and I can't reconcile what it was. I tried saying that it was maybe coyotes or foxes. They make a yipping bark and a really scary scream respectively. There aren't any mountain lions within 500 miles of this place, so it wasn't that either. But whatever it was spoke, and to my knowledge, none of those things do. Whatever it was, it scared two 21-year-olds into leaving a case of beer behind. Honestly, I don't think I want to know what it was. Although, I think I have a pretty good idea. I've told a story before about living in a flat where this thing that I called the Whistler always came by. I had other experiences in this flat too, and this one thing has to be the worst by far. It's hard to describe the sense of dread and fear that this thing gave off. It honestly felt like my life was at risk, and my whole body would scream to run. Anytime I would hear this thing, I was alone, which, of course, just made it all worse. One night, the dog was barking outside, so I got up and went out to look. As I was looking outside, the dog went back in and left me alone, standing in the dark next to the shed. I soon became aware of noises in the shed, but put it down to the wind. That is, until I moved closer, and I felt a strong sense of dread. I listened to the sound sounds like a person on all fours scuffling around. I heard it move toward the shed door, so I ran inside and slammed the door. I sat down and tried to tell myself that it was still just the wind. At first, the dread was going away, but then I could feel it building up again. It felt like it was trying to find a way in, moving back and forth along the walls of the house. Then, I suddenly felt it inside the apartment. It had gotten into the kitchen. I'm not quite sure how. The window, maybe. I could feel it getting slowly closer. I was too scared to look behind me into the kitchen, but I managed to jump up and slam the door. I hoped it would leave, and it did. After this, I would hear it sometimes, just scuffling around at night. The alley at the back was dark and smelly so I assumed it liked it. Now this next bit is truly a fault on my own part. I really should have listened to my own gut feeling. 
It was months later. It was summer and therefore very warm, so I had the back door open. I was on my laptop and it had gotten dark. At some point, I turned the light on and sat back down. I sat facing the back door. My laptop screen stopped me from seeing the bottom half of the door. After a while, I started to hear movement outside and felt uneasy, but I told myself that it was nothing. Yep, I just sat there and told myself I was being stupid. But the feeling grew stronger and stronger, my whole body screaming at me to run. Then, our dog comes running downstairs, stops in the middle of the room, looks at me, and then goes to walk outside. The way she did this was just odd. I pulled down my screen and watched her head toward the back door. As she walked out the back door, there was this thing. Some humanoid figure crouched down by the door. Its skin was dark brown, like dirt and rot, and had texture like it had been burned. It was hairless and skinny, like it hadn't eaten in months. There it was this thing I had been in fear of for so long, right up against the door frame, trying to make its way inside. The figure twisted its emaciated form round to follow our dog. It was crouched down onto its hands and feet. That's why it was making the scuffling noise. I jumped up and threw my laptop to the floor. I ran upstairs and refused to go back down alone. The stupidest thing was that I doubted myself. And if it wasn't for the dog, then I don't know what would have happened. Her look toward me when she came downstairs. I can only imagine she was wondering why I wasn't running away. A friend told me it sounded like a skinwalker, and that Europe does have accounts of such things, but I don't know. I don't know what that thing was. But either way, I'm so happy that we moved. Many people travel to the old citadel in Charleston, South Carolina, because they've heard that it's haunted. But what happens to somebody who stays there without knowing about its allegedly haunted history? Redditor Daphne is dumb has an answer. I had a work trip in Charleston, so I booked an embassy suites, and the old citadel seemed like a nice property in a convenient location. My fiancé found out that it used to be a Civil War armory or something like that, and he was loving the history aspect of the hotel, too. We had a nice southern dinner in one of the most beautiful cities in the country, in our opinion, and when we went back to the hotel, everything seemed fine. We got ready for bed, watched some Netflix, planned our next day, and turned the lights out to go to bed. My fiancé passed out instantly, and I dozed off, but I felt the weirdest pressure consuming my body. Like I had a ton of bricks on me. I've heard of sleep paralysis before, but I've never had it in my life. I opened my eyes, and I saw the darkest-looking figure in the corner of our room. I was completely frozen, and I couldn't speak. I don't know if I was frozen in fear, or if it was something else. I kept staring at the figure to see if it would move, and it looked like after a few minutes, it just faded away into the corner that it had been standing in. I was still frozen, and once I was able to move, I snuggled up with my fiancé and got my phone and looked up the hotel. And that's when I saw that it was named as one of the most haunted hotels in the entire South. After snuggling with my fiancé and mostly being under the covers, I fell asleep. I told my fiancé what happened the next day, and he said that he had had some really dark dreams, which is very strange for him, so something was definitely fishy. We asked the hotel staff at breakfast if the hotel was haunted, and they laughed and said, I'm not going to touch that topic. We had another five days of our stay and I was so scared to sleep, but it never happened again. 
Does this seem like a haunting or just sleep paralysis and a weird coincidence that he had scary dreams that same night too? Could it have been anything? I know that city, although beautiful, has a very dark history. I also forgot to mention that this was at like two or three in the morning and the room felt very cold. When I was able to get my phone to do some research, the hotel Wi-Fi, which was typically lightning fast, was painfully slow, up to the point where I had to use regular data just to use the internet. And even that was unusually slow for a bit. I remember thinking, somebody doesn't want me to know whatever I'm about to find out. I think I had an experience with a skinwalker or its kin. I wonder how far their territory ranges. I lived in Phoenix for a couple of years at the turn of the century. I had two friends who grew up in Globe, a guy and a girl. She wanted to do a spell to make it rain. We went to a place on the Salt River. I don't know what it was called, but it had a parking lot, a pavilion, a bathroom, and the river had concrete steps in it, like man-made rapids. The pavilion had a concrete dais in the middle of it, inlaid with a mosaic of a compass rose. We got there at about 9 p.m. or so, well after dark, only two cars in the parking lot, and they were dusty, no other people. While we were doing our spell, which was minimal, all three of us standing quietly, concentrating around a candle and incense, I heard a noise. It was men and women laughing in unison, then two voices speaking very quickly, but I couldn't understand the words. And then a canine howl. My hair stood on end. We all jerked our heads toward the parking lot and stood stock still for a minute but we didn't see anything or hear anything else. So we went back to concentrating. I didn't think the voices were weird in the moment. I figured the people that owned the cars had come back. I did think the howl was odd coupled with the voices, but I was thinking, cool, I got to hear a coyote. So after we finished the spell, we started wondering where the people were. And as we started talking, we realized that of the three of us, the girl had heard the speaking voices, the guy had heard the laughing, but I was the only one who had heard both or the howl. When I told them what I'd heard, they both got really pale. Their whole demeanor changed to alarm and they said, we have to get out of here right now. I said, okay, but I have to pee first. They were very upset by this but the bathroom was right by us. I went, but they were banging on the door in total panic after I'd been in there 30 seconds. I thought they were being overly dramatic. So we made it to the car and they're acting like we're in a horror movie. We left without further incident. After we got on the road, I asked them why they were so upset. They said that there were things that lived out there that I didn't want to know about. Apparently, people who live in Globe have to deal with this kind of thing a lot, based on more stories the guy told me about living there. He never mentioned the word skinwalker, though. I read about them later and finally understood why they were so scared that night. Reddit user Jerry111165 moved into a house 20 years ago. Little did he know, it had one extra occupant. Here's his story. 20 or so years ago, when our three girls were three little girls, two, four, and six, we lived in a house in Massachusetts. We shared a driveway into the woods with a neighbor, a good guy. He told us that before we moved in, a little girl that had lived in her wheelchair had somewhat recently died from leukemia. I couldn't even imagine. Those poor parents. 
We lived there for seven years. After we had been there a year or two, we started having occurrences late at night, between midnight and 2.30 in the morning. The two older girls shared a bedroom and slept in a bunk bed that I had made. My oldest was in the top bunk. My youngest had her own room. So late at night when the house was dead quiet, the girls' toys would start playing by themselves. Some would light up. Some would make whatever noises the kids' toys do. This started happening a lot, and man, it freaked my wife and me out. We'd be sleeping, and suddenly the kids' toys would start moving around and playing sounds by themselves. We just knew that it was the little girl who had died from leukemia. She just wanted to play, and she did come back and play. Our house was way off the road. Very long, dark driveway. No one came out there, and especially not at night. One night, I was home alone, and somebody knocked at the front door. I didn't think anything of it, and I ran to answer the door. When I got to the top of the stairs, just a few feet from the door, I stopped. I just knew that there was nobody there. My hair stood up. It really scared me. The toys playing by themselves went on for several months. One night, we woke up to my oldest daughter shrieking. Her bunk bed was tall, so when she was sleeping on her back, it was kind of close to the ceiling. I mean, kind of. You know what I mean. She was screaming bloody murder. I think she was probably around six years old. She had woken up and said that a little girl was floating inches above her head, right up against the ceiling, looking down on her. She just wanted to play. I like stories about the paranormal, but I've never personally experienced anything and I tend to be pretty skeptical about them. However, there was a weird experience that I wanted to share and see what people thought about. Back in 2009, I was in college a couple of hours away from home. My grandparents, who I lived with through the last two years of high school, were away from home at their second property where they were building their retirement home for the weekend, and I wanted to get off campus. So my friends, Let's call them Jess and Nina, and I decided to go to the house for the weekend. My friend Jess claims to be sensitive. She has told me stories about things coming into her room when she was growing up, and I can tell she's genuine. But to my knowledge, science has yet to demonstrate the existence of any kind of life after death, so I remain skeptical. I could tell something was off as soon as we pulled up to the house. I'm grabbing my bag from the truck, and I look over to her to see her staring up at the house. I ask her if she's okay, and she just says one word, ocupado, and then proceeds to grab her bag from the truck and we all head inside. Let me give you the layout. The house was built in the 80s, and my grandparents bought the place in 99. The previous owner had died in the home, in his sleep, I think. It was a two-story brick home that backed up to a lake. It was quite a nice place to live, but there were also parts of the house that always used to creep me out for some reason. The front sitting room and dining room upstairs, and the stairs to the basement where I lived in high school. But like I said, I never experienced anything. Anyway, my grandparents knew that we were coming down for the weekend but they were going to be gone for a while, so they shut off all the water in the house except for to the downstairs bathroom. We all go inside, and a few hours later, Jess decides to go downstairs to use the bathroom. Nina and I stay upstairs watching a movie. She's gone for quite some time, and when she comes back upstairs, she asks us what we wanted while she was in the bathroom. Nina and I just look at each other, confused, we hadn't left the room, and we hadn't called for her. 
We didn't know what she was talking about. She asks if either one of us had come downstairs and tried to turn the bathroom door handle while she was in there. We looked at her, incredulous, and tell her that we had not. She grows pale, and my heart starts to race. I think someone is in my house. Nina and I grab knives from the kitchen and go room to room searching for an intruder. We find nothing. The house is quiet for the rest of the weekend. I still think about that sometimes. I don't know what it was. Maybe my friend was daydreaming and maybe she got into her own head. Maybe she was messing with us, although she swears up and down that she wasn't and she looked genuinely terrified. Maybe there was someone in the house, though I'm pretty sure we would have heard them opening a door. Also, there was a security system that beeped if any door or window were opened. I just don't know. What do you think? This occurred over 20 years ago, but it's still fresh on my mind. My son was born early. We were lucky, and he had a few issues, but we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room. And before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from this room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head, as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had just come into the room, only to turn and find out that I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say, peekaboo, when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine, and I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so little that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman. I would find this woman in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side next to the door. My husband slept on the left-hand side. I was asleep and I was woken up by being shaken roughly. I woke up and looked over at my husband and I said, why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and he was on the wrong side from where I was shaken from. I immediately jumped up and ran into my son's room. I flipped the light on, something I had never done up until this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you just need to startle them and they will begin again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and strange occurrences with the pets and toys continued, until my son came off of the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped. The pet stopped acting weird, and the Big Bird toy never went off on its own again. I believe that someone came home with him to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid-twenties, I'll always be grateful for her watching over him and shaking me awake that night so that I could startle my son into breathing again.
So let me start with some background information first. My mom and dad have been serving as missionaries in Ecuador for many years and currently are serving in a spiritual stronghold in a small town on the coast. My parents, in all their years as missionaries, haven't encountered many paranormal or demonic experiences, but there was one out of two experiences that kind of freaked my dad out. This story began around the time that my brother was six and I was just a newborn. My dad was driving the family home when my mom wanted to pull over to a small shop that was owned by a woman. The woman was selling homemade household items, such as woven bread baskets, carved wooden sculptures, blankets, and things like that. My mom spotted a small doll that looked like an Otavalo woman, one of the indigenous people groups of Ecuador. She bought it and showed it to my dad. My dad wasn't too sure about the little doll when he first saw it. He got a weird feeling in his gut once we got back on the road. A few days later, my mom hung the little doll up in front of the kitchen sink window. My dad still had that feeling in his gut, but continued to ignore it. As the day turned into night, my dad woke up from his sleep and glanced at the clock. It was one o'clock in the morning and he decided to go to the kitchen to get a cold glass of water. As he entered the kitchen, he paused and stared at the little doll hanging in front of the window. The doll was totally still as it hung and stared back at him. My dad rolled his eyes and turned his back to open the fridge and get the jug of water. As he was getting his glass of water and was putting the jug back in the fridge, he glanced back at the doll and his heart almost stopped. The doll was swinging back and forth all by itself. There were no windows open or any air draft within the house. The house we lived in had no central air system like American houses do. We had air units in each bedroom along with ceiling fans. So there was no way that any air was making the doll swing back and forth. My dad was still in shock as he stared at this doll. Then the doll swinging started to pick up its pace. And then it started violently spinning around in circles. My dad thought it was going to fly off or break the string that it was hanging from. As the spinning around progressed, my dad remembered not to be afraid of such things. So he literally drank from his glass of water and walked out of the kitchen calmly, even though his heart was beating like crazy. He didn't want fear to be picked up by the doll. And so as he walked back to the bedroom where my mom was, he prayed and asked God for protection. He also checked on my brother and I before going to bed. The following morning, he told my mom what he experienced and my mom was horrified. That very day, they took down the doll, prayed over it against any evil that might have been within it, and wrapped it up in several plastic bags before throwing it away in the trash that was going to be taken out that day. Since that experience, my parents are much more careful with what they bring into their home. And if they do buy something like that, they pray over it to cast out any evil or demonic spirit that might be lurking inside. One night, Redditor Only Figs 278 took their dog for a walk. They spotted something familiar in the woods and then froze. This is their story. I was walking my dog outside before putting him to bed at around 11 p.m. It's very dark as there's a lot of wooded areas around my apartment complex. I usually walk him about half a mile or so out from the complex to a stop sign and light post at the end of the street, which borders the woods. Usually there's nothing out of the ordinary, just woods and the normal animals like squirrels and the occasional deer. Sometimes there's that weird heavy feeling like somebody is watching you intently, but I mostly ignored it and we cut our walk short and headed home, 
since a brief scan of the area showed that nothing was there. Tonight, there was that heavy watched feeling again. But when I scanned the woods, there was something there. A dog with glowing yellow eyes. A dog that looked exactly like my dog, down to the heart-shaped white spot on his chest, standing just past the tree line, staring directly at us. It looked like it could have been his identical twin, but there was just something off about it that invoked that feeling of run. My dog definitely saw it too and was whining and staring hard at it. Usually my dog is reactive to other large dogs, but he seemed more scared than anything else and he wanted to get away too, which is very abnormal behavior for him. After seeing it, I fought that run feeling and I walked quickly but casually back into the gated area and home without looking back, but listening very hard for anything coming behind or to the sides of us. Instinctively, it felt like the safest thing to do, but I don't know why. It seemed like it didn't follow, but who knows. I do know that I will be skipping nighttime walks for a while, that's for sure. Any ideas on what that might have been? Google wasn't much help. We live in North Georgia, at the base of the Appalachians, but I didn't grow up here, so I don't really know about the local folklore. Whatever it was, it was definitely creepy. On my mother's side, there was a story that's been told since I was a kid. It was even told before me to my older siblings, my cousins, and even my younger aunts and uncles. It is somewhat of a ghost story, but as some family stories go, the times and details get muddy. When the story was first told to me, it took place in the early 1920s, and here is how it goes. A family member, it varied from great-grandmother to great-grand-aunt. Well, she was a little kid, and her family was traveling and decided to pull over and picnic and camp for the night. I always assumed they were part of the Dust Bowl movement, because the story was as they were heading to California. The story goes that during the night, the little girl, my great-grandmother or great-grand-aunt, hears screaming and yelling she runs and hides and looks out from behind a tree, and she witnesses her entire family being axed to death. The lore was that if you went to the site and camped there, you could still hear their screams and that nobody ever caught the killer. Fast forward to a couple of years ago through Ancestry.com and researching my family history, I confirmed with a great uncle the truth of our family story. My great-great-grandmother was a survivor of the Apache Massacre in New Mexico. I ended up visiting the site, and there's a wiki page about the 1861 massacre where they attacked settlers that were on their way to California. My family's wagon train was crossing the area, and my great-great-grandmother's family were all killed. She was the only survivor from the family and ended up being adopted by a local family. Our family name was lost as she was so small she didn't remember it. The story was that her mother hid her so she wouldn't be killed. She was later found by a garrison militia in the area and turned over to the Catholic Church nearby. About two days ago, I had a craving for McDonald's. It was around 10.30 or 11 at night, so I went out and got my food and was headed back home. I usually go through a back alley to get to the front of my house faster. This night was no different. But to give you a picture, it's a back alleyway with houses on one side and a field on the other. Anyway, I'm heading home and I take the back alley going about 30 kilometers an hour. 
everything is good, when suddenly a person steps in front of my view, coming from the field side. He was maybe five or ten feet away, so I slammed on my brakes so as not to hit the guy, and I didn't. I was sure of it, but the guy wasn't in my view anymore, so I panicked a little, put the car in park, and got out to see and apologize for not seeing him earlier. Like I said, he wasn't there. I walked out to the front of the car. No dents. I looked under the vehicle and there was nothing there. I moved back a couple of steps to see if there was anyone in the field. I called out, but I got no answer. So I brushed it off as much as one could and I turned around to head back to my car. And that's when I saw myself. Granted, it was a shadow because he was standing right next to my door and I had the headlight aiming at me. I was in front of my vehicle. I asked, are you all right? I'm so sorry. I got no answer. The figure was just standing there. I said hello and still no answer. So I waved my hand and said, yoo-hoo. And he did the same. He waved his hand, but said nothing. It was freaky because it was a mirror image of my hand motion. It really caught me off guard. So I stepped back and so did the shadow. It was so weird. So I walked toward him and he did the same. And as soon as he was in range of the light, he was gone. No puff of smoke, no blur, just there one minute and in the blink of an eye, gone. I was not about to look around anymore. I opened my door and got in and I drove back home. I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. This story comes to us from Redditor Bowler Beautiful 5804. In it, the author recounts living in an over 100-year-old house built on top of a cemetery. Here's the story. When I was in university, I lived in an older house that was built beside a church. The house was over 100 years old, but I'm unsure of its actual age. I lived in the basement and had a few housemates. We didn't know at the time that it was built on a cemetery. That was discovered shortly after I moved out. Weird things would happen in the house, but I'm still not sure if it was haunted or just purely coincidental. I would hear footsteps above my room late at night, and when I would ask the next day who was in the kitchen at 2 a.m., my housemates would say that they never came downstairs at all. My one housemate had a cat, and one day we were in the kitchen. The back door opened by itself and the cat walked in. I did see what I believe was a shadow figure in that house. I had a bookshelf beside my bed and had a Buddha statue on one of the top shelves. In the middle of the night, there was a huge bang. And when I woke up, I saw a black figure jump from the bookshelf to the floor and run out of the room. The shelf with the Buddha figure had fallen off the bookshelf and the Buddha had smashed to pieces on the floor. I thought at first maybe it was my housemate's cat that had somehow knocked it off the shelf. But the next morning when I told my housemate what had happened, he said the cat had been locked in their room with them all night. Shortly after that, I moved out. The house was owned by the church and there was a parking lot in the backyard. The church was adding an addition and had started construction and had started digging up the parking lot behind the house. During the construction, human remains were found, which obviously halted the construction until it was determined why the remains were there. It was found that before the house existed, a small cemetery had been on that land. At least 30 skeletons were found, and nobody was sure if they were ever able to determine the identities or why they were buried there. For some reason, when the house was built, it was decided to build on top of the cemetery 
and the records of the cemetery's existence was either lost or forgotten over time. I'm not sure if the other housemates had experiences there. It was a creepy house, and I remember them mentioning hearing things at night and not liking to stay there alone. Like I said, I don't know if it was haunted or what, but weird things definitely happened there. I don't have many memories of my father because he died when I was just eight years old. However, I do clearly remember the night several years later when he let us know that he was still around and watching over us. First of all, you need to know something about my father. He was fascinated by the supernatural and by the possibility of some sort of existence after death. After it became clear that he would soon lose his battle with lymphatic cancer, he told my mother not to worry. He said, if there's any way for me to reappear after I die, to let you know that I'm okay, then that's what I'm going to do. I'll visit you and the kids all the time. It's gonna be so cool. My mother said her response to that was a pointed and succinct, don't you effing dare. It wasn't that she didn't care what happened to him after he died, or that she didn't want him watching over us. She just knew that she wasn't going to be able to emotionally deal with that situation, and she promised him that that's how she would react. My father followed through on his promise. The story my mother told us was that she was in their upstairs bedroom a few months after his death, thinking about him and crying because she missed him so much. Then she suddenly had the distinct feeling that she was being watched. She turned her head and saw my father standing outside the bedroom window on the balcony, clear as day. He looked healthy and alive. He was wearing a bright blue suit and gave my mother a look that said, is it okay if I come inside? My mother said she stared at him for a moment in total shock. She deliberately blinked her eyes to make certain that she was really seeing what she was seeing. And when she opened her eyes, he was still there, smiling and waiting. That's when my mother followed through on her promise. She closed her eyes tightly and said out loud, I can't handle this. I'm sorry, but I need you to go away and please don't ever do this again. After about 10 seconds, she opened her eyes and this time he was gone. This next part of the story takes place a few years later and I kind of have to set the scene for you. I took a bad fall while playing soccer and the impact totally destroyed my shoulder. I broke it in two places and every ligament and tendon was torn. The reason that this is important to the story is that my shoulder hurt so bad I couldn't easily walk up the stairs to my bedroom, which was across the hall from my parents' bedroom. I was temporarily sleeping in the guest bedroom downstairs and my brother had the bedroom we shared all to himself. That bedroom was right above the guest bedroom. In the hallway outside the guest bedroom, there was a sideboard with shelves on top and drawers below. And on those shelves was an old mantel clock. It looked a lot like somebody cut off the very top part of a typical grandfather clock, and it was small enough to fit neatly on the shelf. The clock had to be wound every so often with a special key, which was kept in one of the drawers below. And when it was properly wound, the small pendulum would swing back and forth to keep the clock going. My dad loved this clock. And while he was alive, he made sure to wind it so that it never stopped. After his death though, my mother never wound the clock again and it eventually did stop. So this clock had been completely silent for years. Late one night, I was trying to go to sleep, but the pain of my injured shoulder was terrible and it was keeping me awake. Plus, as a kid, I had terrible anxiety. Even with the bedroom door closed to help me feel more secure, I wasn't comfortable sleeping in the unfamiliar surroundings of the guest bedroom and being the only person downstairs. Just as I was finally feeling like I might be able to sleep, 
I heard something in the hallway outside the bedroom door. I was immediately freaked out and wide awake because my mother and brother were still upstairs. The stairs in this house were very squeaky and I knew for a fact that I had not heard anybody walking down them. It sounded as though someone or something was messing around with the sideboard. First, I heard a drawer open and then shut. After that, I heard a loud click, followed by a strange sort of grinding sound. Then there were a couple of more clicks, and suddenly, the clock that hadn't made a sound in years started ticking. That sound I heard before wasn't grinding, it was winding. Someone took the key out of the drawer, opened the clock, wound it, and started the pendulum. Apparently, they also put the key back in the drawer where it belonged, because that's where we found it later. At this point, 11-year-old me was not only wide awake, but I was also scared as hell, and hiding as far beneath my covers as I could go with a broken shoulder. After all, when you're a child, covers are magical and repel all things evil, right? The next thing I heard was somebody walking up the stairs. Then everything was quiet for a short while. Soon, though, I heard footsteps moving around all over the upstairs. I even heard someone directly above me open and close the creaky sliding closet doors in my bedroom. After that, I clearly heard footsteps come down the stairs, someone open and then close the door to the guest room where I was struggling to breathe inside my cover cave. And then soon after, the footsteps returned up the stairs, and finally all was silent, except for one thing. The clock continued with its relentless tick-tock, tick-tock. Eventually, sleep caught up with me, and I didn't wake until my mother came to check on me in the morning. While we were eating breakfast that morning, my mother looked at me and paused for a long time. Finally, she asked, were you up and walking around last night? I told her I was not, and then I described to her all the noises I had heard. My mother told me she heard noises during the night too, and had searched all over the house to see who it was. It was her walking all around upstairs, opening and closing the squeaky closet, coming down the stairs, opening and closing the guest bedroom door, and then going back up. So who made the other sounds we both heard first, we wondered. And why was that clock ticking? Suddenly, my mother's eyes grew wide. Oh my goodness, she said. Last night was the anniversary of the night your dad died. I think it must have been him trying to let us know that he's still watching over us. And with that, we both went to look at the clock, which was still ticking. Thanks, Dad. Message received. We love you too, and we miss you. So I was going to my sister's graduation at Binghamton University, and my family rented out a well-priced Airbnb for two nights, the only one that had five bedrooms, because extended Chinese family. It was a Victorian-era house, completely decked out with Victorian-American aesthetics. Trinkets, paintings of serious children, photos of even more serious people, ornate flower wallpaper, and dolls. Many dolls. We were picking out bedrooms, and no one in the family wanted the room with the creepy dolls. I'm not superstitious, and I didn't see the room, and I didn't understand the gravity of the situation, so I was like, sure, I'll take the room with the dolls. You see where this is going. As midnight approached, I got tired even after being energized by a tiny bite of baklava and an espresso. So I was the first to go to bed. I went into the room and saw the dolls. They were locked inside a glass case, all facing the bed. I was like, um, okay, don't be silly. Also, you're a brave trans girl and they're probably more afraid of you than you are of them because you're something they've likely never encountered before. 
silly thoughts. I decided to take out my black ebony-handled Opinel pocket knife and sleep with it at the nightstand so I would have some protection. I watched YouTube for a while, turned off the lamp, and went under the covers. I felt the doll staring, but my rational side told me that it was all in my head. By 3 a.m., I was half-conscious, slipping in and out of pure unconsciousness. While I was in a dreamlike state, I was aware of everything going on around me. The dolls staring. Were they next to me? I was afraid to open my eyes. I blinked. And I thought, it's okay. I have protection. I didn't dare look at the ebony-handled knife on the nightstand. I was afraid that I would see a doll next to me. Then I remembered, statistically, armed victims of assault tend to have their weapons taken away and used against them. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get stabbed to death. It was at that moment that I heard vividly in a playful childlike voice, it would be my heart's desire. I immediately became alert, like R2-D2 rebooting after being in low power mode alert. Adrenaline rushed through me. I heard a ringing in my ear as my awareness went from zero to 60 in a split second. I stayed like that until the sun started to rise at around 5 a.m. That was when I fell asleep. When I woke up, I dreaded having to sleep there again for yet another night. The next night, I thought, you know what? Violence begets violence. So I slept with my pocket knife in my bag instead. I fell asleep and slept through the night. I lived in Germany for many years while my father was stationed there in the U.S. Army. We lived off base in private housing, and I loved it. That country is amazing. The vast forests, the mountains, the countryside, the farmlands, the little towns, everything. I quickly became really good friends with some local boys whose parents owned the town's dairy farm. We were always in the forests, running around and exploring fishing, playing army, stuff like that. I was around eight or nine years old at that time, and I'm over 40 now. One night, I stayed late at the farm hanging out with the guys. I left at about nine or 10-ish. It was dark, but the moonlight gave pretty good vision. I lived just across the soccer field and then across a small cornfield from the farm. As I'm walking through the soccer field, I see a bit of movement just really quickly, out of the corner of my eye along the tree line at the edge of the field. I quickly stepped up my pace. As I turn to take my usual path through the cornfield to my house, I see at least a half a dozen silhouettes emerge from each side of the rows of corn on the sides of the path. I froze. They just stood there. And then all of a sudden, there's one standing behind me. Before I can snap around and get out of there, he asks in German where I'm going. I turned around, and what I see surprises but also relieves me. I answered in English and told him I was headed home. He was then curious about my English. Turns out it was a team of special forces operators. I mean, these guys were decked out so much in tactical gear I couldn't comprehend how they were able to move so stealthily. Night vision goggles, packs, bags, weapons. There was even a dog. They looked like total badasses. Apparently they were using these small towns to do some off base training. I just happened upon them this particular night. I will never understand why they chose to break cover and show themselves. They could have easily just stayed put and I would have walked right by them none the wiser, but they all walked me home as it was on their way back. It started off super creepy, but it was actually pretty cool, and it's an experience that I will never forget.
My boyfriend and I rented a cabin in the middle of nowhere in upstate New York. We arrived on Tuesday. By Wednesday morning, I awoke with a deep cut on my hip. On Thursday morning, we were awoken by the TV turning on by itself. On Friday, my boyfriend started seeing shadows out of the corner of his eye. And then that night into Saturday morning, we were about to go to sleep at 3.30. We stayed up really late. As soon as we turned off the lights to sleep, we heard a deep guttural growl that lasted for about two seconds. We both immediately froze and then turned the lights back on. Now we were wide awake. We then realized that pictures of one child in the house had been defaced and an extremely heavy chandelier started swinging. I'm not entirely sure what was in there and we're not totally positive if it's safe to return. This is something that happened a while ago at a cabin that my family and I were renting. My sister and I were sitting outside on the back porch around 11 p.m., maybe getting closer to midnight. We were talking when we heard a noise. To me, it sounded like someone was clapping their hands, kind of like in The Conjuring, at least that's what it reminded me of. No one was outside, and the neighbors were pretty far down the road. So if it was someone, they would have had to walk all the way to the house and be standing pretty much right outside of it. The rest of my family were talking inside the kitchen. We could have heard them, and it would have been obvious if they were the ones clapping. It happened three times in three different locations. Once right next to the house, once in front of us, which would have been in the back, in the woods. And the third time came from the front of the house. I really don't know how to explain it, but it was pretty creepy. Given that this happened in the middle of the woods at night in the Pacific Northwest, as well as the fact that I was a child when it happened, I understand that this could be almost anything. However, even at 23, recalling this moment still brings tears to my eyes and cold chills down my back. I was about 10 years old and it had to have been around 11 p.m. I was at a horse camp in Battleground, Washington and I was the only person awake in my cabin. I heard this sound far off in the distance. It sounded like a horse whinnying, which makes sense. Only it didn't stop. It was one long whinny that kept going. After about six to seven seconds, the pitch grew lower and lower until it turned into this god awful, low guttural scream. It went on for probably about 30 seconds with no pause. I know 30 seconds seems short, but when you're sitting there as a child with nothing between you and it but a screen door, it feels like ages. I never heard that sound again after that, and I know it's a very short story, but even now when I tell this story, it brings tears to my eyes. Other than Bigfoot, because I'm sure it's not that, is there any folklore pertaining to the Pacific Northwest that could account for this sound? I don't know of anything that starts out as a horse whinny, never stops, and ends up in a demonic growling scream. I would love to know what it was that I experienced. Maybe I won't be so afraid of it anymore. A few months ago, three other friends and I went out to camp near a lake. We went camping on the shore of the lake, 
right next to a forest that went up a hill. It was nighttime, and the sky was very clear. We had a fire going, and so one friend and I decided to go a bit farther near to the lake to look at the stars. You could see the Milky Way and everything. It was really cool. While we were there, we were talking a little bit, and I noticed a light in the forest above where the other two friends were and above where we were camping. It was really bright in the middle, like a white orb. And at first I thought it was a person with a flashlight. The next thing I know, it zipped in a straight line, super fast, then went back again with the same speed. Then instantly it just disappeared. My other friend who was with me saw it, and we both got really freaked out. He is very religious and can't explain it to me, but still doesn't want to believe that it's anything paranormal. So I'm kind of alone in this. The other friends didn't see anything because it was behind them. I have no idea what it could have been. The weird thing was that it was at the moment we noticed it that it reacted and moved around and disappeared. I wonder if it had been there the whole time while we were camping. There would have been no way to see it. Only when we moved away and then faced toward our camp could we have seen it. I told my other friends about it and they thought I was just joking. And the friend who was with me and saw it doesn't want to talk about it. So I don't really have any good answers. For the rest of the camping trip, I felt really uneasy. We were going camping in Western Washington. It was late and we weren't going to make it to our usual campsite. So my uncle mentioned that he knew about a lake not far off the freeway. My uncle had a box truck and we were all going to sleep in it. There were six kids and my uncle and father. My dad was driving an old Bronco with some of us with him. When we found the lake and parked, us kids went to bed in the box truck because it was close to midnight. My dad and uncle started a campfire and were just BSing. I couldn't sleep, so I was chilling in my sleeping bag listening to them. All of a sudden, we started hearing wild noises, like chanting, and then these sounds that just made the hair on my neck stand straight up. I immediately thought Bigfoot. My dad and uncle freaked out, and my dad got his pistol out. They waited another 10 minutes, and the sounds got louder. Then they got everybody up and packed us all up, and we left in a hurry. I have never seen them that scared. We were all scared. I have no idea what the location was now. I was nine years old, and this was back in the 80s. But that experience never left me. So I decided to post this after the sixth person who has come into my basement has said that they feel off, overwhelmed, and like they're being watched. I usually bring them down to play billiards, and I have my old PS2 and Xbox 360 down there as well. The basement is finished, painted, and carpeted, and there's an office down there too. They always leave saying that they all felt the same things and that they're so put off by it that they never want to go into my basement again. Yesterday, one of my friends left his mask in my basement, went back down to get it by himself, and said that he felt like his heart was beating out of his chest. I also want to note that when we first moved in, for the first month or so, we would find an unreasonable amount of dead centipedes across the basement floor, but only in the room with the billiards table. The office room never had a single centipede in it. All of a sudden, the centipedes just stopped. Never saw one again. It's been two years. I felt the same weirdness, but I always ignored it. I'm usually afraid of basements because I generally don't like being underground, so it wasn't unusual to me. 
but then everyone else started talking about it. I've also noticed that my house has become more active, as in lights turning on and off when nobody's home, doors opening and closing for no reason, doorknobs jiggling aggressively, things moving to very peculiar places. I really don't know what to do with this. The reason that I'm writing this now and not before is because I was only reminded of this the other day. I was driving to the store with my son and he wanted me to listen to a song. I don't even remember the words. I just remember that the tune brought me back to a place, a place that I had tucked away in my memory in hopes of forgetting. Now, I can't get that old lady's mouth out of my head. This happened in 1987. I'm sure about the date because of the Whittier earthquake. It just so happens that at that very moment, I was painting a wall in the dining room a different color. That's when it hit. I ended up streaking paint across the wall as I ran over to hold our overly large fish tank from falling off of this stupidly flimsy stand we had it on. This took place in Hacienda Heights, California. My boyfriend at the time wasn't really welcome at my mother's house because she couldn't shake this bad feeling about him. So being young and dumb, I moved out of her house and into a place that I found down the street with him. I wish I had listened to her. It was a small one bedroom bungalow. At first we were getting along just fine, but it seemed like things changed as the months passed and we started fighting more and more. I thought it was odd that I, Susie Homemaker, didn't even want to make that house a home. It was just a weird vibe and it got darker the longer we stayed. As you walk in the partial glass front door, on the left, there were two white window pane doors on the built-in bookcases on both sides of a fireplace, then the dining room, and in the back was the kitchen. The bedroom was on the right. We couldn't afford a bed frame, so our full-size mattress was on the floor under the window, and that was the only thing there besides the clock. There was an uneasiness in that bedroom that I couldn't put my finger on. I felt very depressed in there. Oh, little things happened throughout the house from the moment we moved in, but we just laughed it off until it was no longer funny. It seemed like when we were at odds with each other, it intensified in a dark way. Oftentimes my boyfriend would just leave and I was alone, sometimes for days. And I thought that he did it on purpose because he knew that I was scared to be there alone. At first, I was fine, not scared of anything, until one of those nights. I was sleeping and I was jolted up by an extremely loud bang that left my ears ringing. I jumped up and at first I looked out the front window, thinking that it was something outside, but the streets were still. I checked the house, but there was nothing out of place. The next night it happened again, louder than before. Only this time I glanced at the clock before checking the house. It was five o'clock AM on the dot and my room was freezing. I tried to get back to sleep, but I heard muffled wails of a woman. I literally had to lift my head from the pillow to listen, but nobody was around. The next day my boyfriend came home and with a few words and some hand-picked flowers, all was stupidly forgiven. I told him what had happened, but he shrugged it off, telling me that it could have been a backfire or the pipes, and I bought it. One early evening after dinner, we were going to watch TV on the couch in the living room, and I excused myself to go to the bathroom. I kept hearing him yelling out things to me, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. I opened the door and looked at him, he turned absolutely pale, and he was crawling backwards on the couch with wide eyes. Then he leaped up and ran into the kitchen, looking around and checking the back door. 
He came out, saying that the door was locked from the inside. After he calmed down and I could understand him, he told me that he was talking to me in the kitchen. He asked me why I was putting a granny house dress on and was asking for snacks, and he was getting a bit upset that I didn't answer him. I had no answers. There had been a few times where we both saw what looked like a teenaged boy sitting on the front stoop, sometimes holding his head in his hands, but when we approached him, it was like he was never there. I pointed out faces in the glass panes of the bookcase that looked like they were talking to us while we were watching TV. They were just reflections, but they were reflections of something that wasn't in the room. Their features were outlined by the flickering light from the TV. But after a while, the faces became more defined. In the beginning, my boyfriend thought I was making it all up, until he saw it for himself. We heard banging on the bathroom door, like somebody was banging with their fist, even when we weren't in there, and an older guy's voice saying, Ah, come on, sending us running outside a couple of times, then feeling stupid sitting outside, so we went in and stayed spooked for the rest of the day. I called the landlord to ask him if something had happened there, or if he could make it stop. But before I could even open my mouth, he was asking if I was calling to complain about something he had no control over. In the background, I heard his wife say, Is that the young couple? They want to move, do they? Well, there goes another one. It sounded like this had happened to them a lot before, and that really got my blood boiling. Why would they rent this place to us without even a heads up? Realizing that they would be of no immediate help, I just hung up on him. I couldn't move, I had no money, and my mother for sure wouldn't let me move back in as long as I was with my boyfriend. We lived there for at least four months when our relationship started to spin out of control. He was being forceful and demanding and drinking a lot more. One night he asked me to pick him up, so I did. And somehow I ended up with a broken arm because I didn't want him to drive my car drunk. I had to beg him to shift gears so that I could drive to the ER because he was tired. And after the hospital, I was exhausted and I just wanted to sleep. So I went to the bedroom while he opted to lay on the couch and watch TV. The next thing I know, he's grabbing his stuff, saying that he's not staying there anymore and walking out, leaving me there alone with a broken arm. Wow. I remember that it was a warm night, but it was raining. So I laid on the couch with only the screen door closed so that I could hear the rain. The lights went out, which freaked me out even more. So I put candles on the coffee table and one on the bookcase and sat back down on the couch. I was too afraid to sleep in the bedroom. I sat there and saw those faces and one was an old lady. She was frowning and her mouth was moving like she was trying to over enunciate to tell me something or yell at me. Her face got bigger like she was coming closer to the glass and then back. She kept waving her finger at me. Her gray hair was straight and put back with a headband. Her mouth was just going on, opening and closing, and the candlelight glistened on her bottom teeth. Her teeth looked a little, I don't know, long and old, if that makes any sense. Then there was a middle-aged man who didn't look directly at me. He looked aggravated, but not at me, more like at everything and everyone. And then a crying teenager. His face was so full of despair. I could make out the words, please, and no, no, no. And then he put his hand on his face. Looking at him brought tears to my eyes and my heart felt so very heavy. It dawned on me that this was the kid on our doorstep. I must have sat there for hours with the blankets up to my nose until the lights came back on and I finally fell asleep. The next morning, I walked down to the corner store and I called my mother, who was happy to find out that I was ready to come home. Before I handed the keys over, my mother had some words with the landlord. 
He told her that he had the place blessed before I moved in, and that he was really hoping that it had worked. He also told my mom that he bought the place already haunted. All he knew from digging was that it was two bungalows together, but one burnt down. But the one that I was renting was the one where an old lady lived, whose grown son had come upon hard times due to his alcoholism. He lost his wife and couldn't keep a job, so he and his teenage son moved into her place with her. His son was so unstable that he found a gun in the house and ended up shooting himself in the bedroom. His grandmother had died from a heart attack not long after. He didn't know what happened to the man. Talk about a roundabout. I don't know why that tune, or maybe the light reflecting off the rain on my windshield, made me think about that old lady's mouth, but it did. Now I understand a little more as to why I hate reflective things in my home. My family and I have always been animal lovers. I've never known a time when we didn't have cats or dogs with us, and I feel like they helped raise me. When my father was in college, he adopted two cats named Tigger and Cito. Tigger passed away due to a coyote, and after she passed, Cito was never the same. She was grumpy and preferred to be by herself, but I would annoy her with my love anyway. One night, I was carrying her in a wicker basket with some blankets. I would bring her room to room with me as I cleaned up. I'd been petting her and listening to her purr when she suddenly stopped moving. I was maybe 12, and I remember praying for the first time to bring her back to me. It was awful to bring her out to my mom and tell her she had passed. I had a tradition that whenever a pet died, I would make a concrete headstone with little marbles and their name on it. I had set it on our kitchen counter to dry and I left it there. The next morning I checked on it and found a small piece of her fur right in the center. I went around to everyone and asked if they had placed it there and they all said that they had not. It felt like she was giving me one last piece of her. I kept it in a tiny knick-knack tea kettle it lives there with a few of her whiskers that I had found weeks after her passing. I feel like she came to give me one last gift. This story is a fascinating tale from Artistic Rip 8184 about a very peculiar patron that entered their restaurant. Here's their story. So this happened a while back and it still creeps me out. I'm hoping that this counts as a paranormal experience because it was the most realistic one I've ever had. I've heard that the dead can visit us in human form, but I've always wondered if that's true. I was waiting tables at the restaurant I worked at one afternoon and stopped by to greet a table that had an older woman and a man sitting together. When I spoke to them, the man was looking down so I didn't notice him right away. The woman ordered her beverage and I asked the man what he would like to drink. He looked up at me and said, I'll take a diet Pepsi. All I could do was stare my dad passed away 26 years prior when I was a kid, but I swear on my life that the man sitting in front of me was the living, breathing version of him. Same face, same height and build, same voice, even the same gold tooth. I don't have a lot of good memories of my dad because he was super abusive to me and my mom, so I had a whole lot of emotions hit me all at once. When I could finally speak, I managed to stammer out, Oh, okay, I'll be right back. I took their order and checked on them a couple of times. When they paid, the man smiled at me with this twinkle in his eye that made me feel like it was my dad. He thanked me, 
but when he did, he didn't say the name listed on the receipt or on my name tag, my given name. Instead, he used my nickname, the name that only family uses, but I had never told either of them that name at all. This happened to me many years ago. I was maybe 10. I'm 23 now. My sister and I were over at her friend's house, which she had told us was haunted during prior visits. It was just us. Her mom was at work and her little sister was at daycare. We were down in the basement, which was half finished. It was furnished, but the walls had no siding yet. We were messing around down there, jumping on the couch, just doing kid stuff. We decided we were hungry, so we headed upstairs, shut the basement lights off, and took an immediate right at the top of the stairs into the kitchen. We were in there maybe a few minutes making sandwiches, when all of a sudden we heard the loudest, most blood-curdling scream I've ever heard come from the basement. It was absolutely terrifying. I don't know if three kids have ever gotten out of a house so fast. We sat on the curb across the street until her mom got home. I've had several encounters with what I presume to be the paranormal, but that was by far the most horrifying and memorable. It still gives me the creeps to talk about it, and to this day I'll sometimes text my sister to ask if she remembers it, just to make sure I'm not crazy. In fall of 2017, I was picking up a friend from his dorm room in the early morning at sunrise. I was parked in my car on campus at Denver University. As I was waiting for him to arrive to the car, out of my peripheral vision, I saw what looked like a shadow person. It was just a torso though, and it was up floating on the sidewalk about 30 feet away from me on the other side of the road and going in the opposite direction of me. The second I turned my head to really acknowledge what I was looking at, the figure completely disappeared, and below it, a cat appeared out of thin air and sprinted across the road. I have no idea what I saw 